Okay, uh, welcome to today's session. This is business law. Uh, today we are going to start on unit two. During the last sessions, we managed to uh, finish unit one. So now we will cover unit two. And unit two is more about non corporate and corporate law. So we we'll look at issues that relate to corporate and non corporate law. So that's what unit two is all about. And in that slide, it provides the course content, the course outline. In terms of unit two, uh, what are we going to cover? So we'll look at a brief introduction of what non corporate entities are. We talk about like sole proprietorship. We we'll also look at societies. We we'll look at partnerships. Um, we we'll look at company and the company incorporation and the procedures that you can follow in terms of incorporating a company. We we'll look at the various types of meetings that are conducted in different companies. We we'll look at issues of shares, uh, directorship, how directors can be appointed, how directors can be removed, what are the powers of directors, what should be the qualifications of directors. We we'll look at also issues of auditing, loans, debatures, investments, and also we we'll look at how we can prevent um, management uh, in terms of oppress, oppressing the employees. And finally, we are going to look at how we can wind up a company and the procedure that can be followed. So this is what is contained as the course outline for unit, uh, for unit two. So as a beginning, because we are talking about corporate and non-corporate entities, so we need to first look at what do we mean when we talk about corporate entities and also what do we mean when we are talking about non-corporate entities. So we start with a corporate entity. When we talk about a corporate entity, we are saying it is a business structure that is formed specifically to perform activities such as running an enterprise or holding of assets. So this is it's more about a structure. It's more about a business structure that is formed to run a business or to manage a business. And although it may be comprised of individual directors, officers and shareholders, a corporation is a legal entity. So we are talking about setting up a corporate entity to manage a business. And then as that entity is managing a business, that entity is taken as a legal entity on its own. So it's not the person now who is responsible legally for that particular business, but it is that legal entity, it is that company, it is that business that is now regarded as a legal entity. That's what a corporation is all about. That's what a corporate, corporate entity is all about. So on its own, the corporate entity is taken as a legal entity. And when we talk about that corporate entity being taken as a legal entity, that means it can sue or it can be sold. So that's what it is all about. It is a legal entity. And corporations are created through an incorporation process initiated by either a single shareholder or a group of shareholders with ownership rights to the corporation. So the shareholders can decide to set a corporation. And that corporation or that corporate entity can be created by a single shareholder. I might have a company or I might want to start a company as a single person, and then I have uh, all the shares to that company. But then I will register that company so that it operates as a single, as, as a legal entity, as a corporate entity apart from me. So that company on its own will have the right to sue or to be sued. And that company now will be separated from me because it has been registered as a corporate entity. Or it can be a group of shareholders, people who come together, uh, contribute money and or buy shares to a company and they say, okay, but what we are going to do in terms of incorporating this company, let this company be a separate legal entity. So that can also be done. So when you talk about creation of corporations or creation of corporate entities, this can result or the process can be initiated by is either a single shareholder or it can also be um, uh, initiated by a group of shareholders. So, apart from the corporate entity, we also have a non-corporate entity. And when we talk about a non-corporate entity, we are talking about still a legal entity, 
but that does not go through the incorporation process. So it does not go through the incorporation process that we are talking about in the previous slide. So in terms of an uncorporate entity, shareholders possess certain responsibilities and rights that owners of other legal entities do have, do not have. And non-cooperation companies such as partnership or so partnership have no legal distinction between the owner. So the key distinction is coming here. When you are looking at a corporate entity and a non-corporate entity, when you talk about a corporate entity, as we discussed earlier on, it is taken as a corporate legal body. So there is that distinction between the owners and the entity. There is that legal distinction between the owners and the corporate entity. But when you look at the non-corporate entity, there is no legal distinction between the owners and also the entity. So there is no legal distinction between the two when you talk about corporate and uh, non-corporate entity. You talk about, like for example, partnerships. You talk about sole proprietorship. I can start a company or a business as a sole proprietor. If I'm running that business as a sole proprietor, there is no legal distinction or differences between me and that business which I am running. So, what are the implications of this? So, this means that owners of such entities do not have the same legal pro protection as a corporate entity. So, they do not enjoy that legal protection. Anything that happens to their company will directly affect them because they are almost like they are taken as the same. There is no legal distinction between the two when you look at a non-corporate entity. So, we have a corporate entity which is a legal body on its own, and there is a legal distinction between um, the owners and the entity and the company. And then we have a non-corporate agency or an non-corporate entity where there is no legal distinction. But in terms of um, formulating or coming up with these entities, it is much easier to form a, co um, uh, a corporate entity um, than registering it. So basically, when you talk about you are registering a non-corporate entity, it is much easier. A sole proprietorship is much easier. But when you want to register a corporate agency or a corporation, then there are a certain chain of activities, requirements, and all that that needs to be done. So it is a bit complicated to register a corporate entity as compared to a non-corporate agency. So, talking about non-corporate corporations, we can talk about sole proprietorship. So, who is a sole proprietor? And when we talk about a sole proprietor, just looking at the name, a sole proprietorship, this is a situation whereby you have, as the owner of the business, you have con complete control of the business. So, this is a business whereby you, there is no that separation between the owner of the business and the one who has control over the business. So that's what a sole proprietorship is all about. And as a, the owner of the business, you make all the important decisions and also responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the business. So you are responsible for everything. You are responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the business. However, in exchange of that, you also get all the income that is earned by the business. So you get everything. Everything that is coming out of that particular business, you get it. It's yours. So that's what sole proprietorship is all about. In terms of tax or taxation, profits that are earned are taxed as personal income. So they are not taxed as corporate income. The tax is taxed as the income is taxed as personal income. So a sole proprietorship is a business owned and managed by a single individual. So you are looking at a situation where ownership of a business and management of the business is done by the same individual. A situation whereby you cannot separate the ownership and the management of the business because this is done by one person. That's what a sole proprietorship is all about. And most of the businesses that we have most of them are sole proprietors, whereby there is no any legal distinction between the owners and the managers of that particular business. So, how 
can one form a sole proprietorship? What is the process that basically one can go through to form a sole proprietorship? So, as I said already, there is no separate cost to establish a sole proprietorship because it's the owner who is also the manager. So a sole proprietorship is established when the owner begins operating his business. So I want to start my own business, then uh, I establish that business, my own business as the owner, and I start that business, and then I manage it. And most of the time, there are no separate licenses to obtain to form a sole proprietorship. The sole proprietor will be maintained as long as the owner keeps doing the business. So it's my business as the owner. So I'm the one managing everything that relates to sole proprietorship. So what are some of the advantages of sole proprietorship? Apart from what we've already talked through to say, it is very easy to come up with a sole proprietorship. You don't have to face a lot of registration hurdles in order to come up with a sole proprietorship. So sole proprietorship have functional and tax advantages compared to other businesses. We already talked about it. Function, you are the one who is managing everything. You are the one, who, as a sole proprietor, you are in control of everything. And even in terms of taxation, you are much better as a sole proprietorship as compared to other business properties. So one of the functional advantages of sole proprietorship is that they are easier set up than other business. So it's very easy to set up a sole proprietorship. The requirements for, for you to go out there and form a sole proprietorship are much minimal compared to if you are to form other legal entities. And the sole proprietorship is that the owner maintains 100% control and ownership. That's another advantage. You are the owner. So you have 100% control of the business. And you also own the business 100%. So you, you control all the business decisions. You control everything. The owner, the sole proprietor is in control. So that's another advantage of sole proprietorship. And the owner is also entitled to the profits and the control of the business. So as a sole proprietor, whatever profits comes out of the business, they are your profits. You enjoy those profits. So these are some of the key advantages of sole proprietorship. It's about, I think if you can look at all these advantages, they are revolving around the aspect of ownership and control. Because you as a sole proprietor, you have ownership to the business. You as the sole proprietor, you have extensive control to the business. So because you are the owner and you control the business, you manage everything and you also enjoy the benefits that comes out of it. You control the profits that are coming out of your business because you are 100% in control. But apart from having these advantages, when we talk about sole proprietorship, there are also other disadvantages that comes in as a result of a sole proprietorship. So now we want to focus on looking at the disadvantages. So when you look at sole proprietorship, it has what we call as liability and also functional disadvantages as compared to other businesses. So there are liabilities that you as a sole proprietor, you have to bear. And there are some functional disadvantages that you as a sole proprietor, you also have to bear. And the biggest disadvantage of a sole proprietorship is the potential exposure to liability. Because as the owner, you are liable to everything that comes in. Because there is no separation between the owner and the business. So if someone wants to sue the business, that means that person can directly sue you because you are the business. There is no distinction between the business and you. So that's a key uh, disadvantage of what sole proprietorship is all about. You are directly liable to everything that happens in that business. So if the owner of a sole proprietorship wishes to include another owner, he must dissolve the sole proprietorship and form a new business entity such as general partnership. Because this one has just to be managed by the owner. It cannot be co-managed. This has to be 100% owned by the owner and 100% also controlled by the owner. But the key disadvantage when we talk about sole proprietorship is that the issue of liability. You are liable. 
you are liable. Liability is a key issue when we talk about sole proprietorship. So you are liable to as the owner to whatever comes out of that uh, sole proprietorship. Now, the other aspect is about we will now want to move on. We are moving on from sole proprietorship. Now we want to move on to partnerships. So moving so from sole proprietorship to partnerships. And we want to understand what partnerships are all about and then what can be done, uh, what is the process that we can go through when we are formulating partnerships and also what are the advantages and the limitations that relates to partnerships. So a partnership is a business owned jointly by two or more people. Because you remember we are talking about the sole proprietorship. The sole proprietorship is about one person, one individual owning a business. But when you talk about a partnership, we are talking about a situation whereby two or more people, they come together and then they form a business. That's what a partnership is all about. And partnership is the relationship between persons who have agreed to share the profits of a business. You remember, in terms of sole proprietorship, we talked about the fact that um, all the profits um, and the investment in the business and the profits that comes out um, remains with the owner. But when we talk about a partnership, that means these people are coming together. And as they are coming together, they are putting their resources together to manage a business or to run a business. And that means even the profits that can come out of it will also end up being shared out by both parties. If it's two partners, that means the profits that will come out will be shared by both of them. If it's one, the profits that, uh, if it's three, the profits that comes out will also be shared among us the three partners. So that's what partnership is all about. It's not just about one person having control of everything, but it relates to uh, the sharing aspect. So the profits that comes out is shared. The management arrangements that comes out shared and all the key aspects that are related to it are shared that's what this is all about so when you talk about now setting a partnership setting a partnership is a bit complex as compared to setting up a sole proprietorship because a sole proprietorship is much easier to set because it's just one person setting up a sole proprietorship but when you talk about setting out a partnership, it is a bit complicated because you are having two or more partners coming together and then agreeing on what they need to do. So you look at setting up a partnership as being a more complex than setting up a sole proprietorship. And when you talk about the cost, the cost of setting out a partnership is much higher as compared to the costs that can be accrued when you are setting out uh, a, a, a sole proprietorship. So in terms of the sole proprietorship, the cost is lower, but also the complexity is much uh, higher when you talk about setting out a partnership. So it's possible to form a simple partnership without the help of a lawyer. You can do it yourself, but most of the time it is advisable that when setting out a partnership, it is important to seek out legal advice, to seek out professional advice, whether from the legal perspective or from the accounting perspective, to help you to be able to set out a partnership. So partnerships are a bit, as you can see, they are not that simple to form as compared to a sole proprietorship. And when you talk about a partnership, there are some key characteristics, there are some key attributes that can help us to define what a partnership is all about. So the first one is that it involves association of two or more persons. We've already talked about it. A sole proprietorship is one, just one person managing the business. 
but and owning and managing that particular business. But when you are talking about a partnership, we are talking about two or more people coming together, agreeing to manage a business, agreeing to put their resources together into a business, agreeing to put their efforts together to run that business, agreeing to also jointly share the profits that can come out of that business. So it involves an association of two or more persons. Another characteristic relates now to the agreement, because when if we talk about a partnership as a, involving an association of two or more persons, that means for these people to come together and work together, there should be an agreement, because without an agreement, they cannot come together, they cannot work together. So these two people need to come up with an agreement. And that's another characteristic. You cannot talk about a partnership without an agreement. A partnership needs to be there based on an agreement. The two parties are supposed to come together and sign an agreement. That details how the partnership will be managed, how the partnership will be run, what are the shares that the various partnership members are contributing, and all that. What, how they are going to share the profits and everything. All that needs to be included in the agreement. And another characteristic of a partnership is about a business, because these people are coming together to perform a business. They are not coming together just for any other function, but their key function is business-oriented. So a partnership is about business. And it is also about sharing of profits. Whatever profits that comes out, those profits are not just for one individual, but those profits will end up being shared by a number of key uh, partners who have invested their resources, their time, their money into the partnership. And when you talk about a partnership, because a partnership is more about the association of two or more people, that means there should be a mutual agency. There should be a mutual cooperation. So when you talk about it, it is more about a mutual agency. Two parties, two or more parties coming together and mutually working together. So a partnership is referred to as a mutual agency. So when we look at partnership, when we are talking about the key characteristics of partnership, we are looking at it as an association of two or more people. It involves an agreement. It is more all about business and also the profits that are realized are shared and it is also a mutual agency. These are some of the key characteristics and key or key attributes of a partnership. So when you talk about a partnership, that means you have a number of partners, as we've already said, coming together. So what are some of the rights that the partners do have? Because each and every partner, they have rights and obligations. So we start by looking at what are the rights of a partner. The first one is the right to take part in a business. And this is contained in the partnership agreement. Because in partnership, everyone has a right to take part in that business. And in the partnership agreement, it will be clearly stated, or it will be clearly uh, specified to say this is how each and every partner will take part or will participate in the conduct of the business. So the partnership agreement, which we've already talked about as one of the characteristics for a partnership, needed to clearly specify in terms of how um, the various partners are going to conduct the business, how the various partners are supposed to participate in the business. So the key aspect here as a right of a partner is that each and every partner has a right to take part in the conduct of the business. And the second right of a partner in partnership is that they have, each and every partner do have a right to be consulted. So every partner has an inherent right to be consulted in all matters before decisions are made. 
no one can just come in and make a decision on behalf of all the other partners in a partnership arrangement. Then that means it's not a partnership. That means it's more a sole proprietorship. But when you are talking about a partnership, before even each and every decision is made, before the important po uh, positions are made, it is important that all the partners have to be consulted. And all the partners have to express their views before any decision is taken by the partners. And as you can see there, we are talking about before any decision is taken by the partners. Not is taken by just one person or one individual. It's not an individual making all the decisions that relates to partnerships. So all the partners need to be consulted. All the partners need to input their views into the whole decision-making process of the partnership. And once they are held and everyone has provided their views, then the partners as a team can be able to come out and make a decision on an issue. Another right of a partner relates to right of access to accounts. So subject to contract between the partners, every partner has a right to access the accounts. They have a right to inspect and they have a, a right to get a copy of the books of accounts of the firm. So they have a right to go through the accounts of the, of the organization. Because they're a partner, they need to understand what is the financial position of the company. They need to have a fair understanding of or be well appraised in terms of the financial position of the company because they are a major part of the company. They are a major partner of the company. So they have the right to accounts. They have a right to go and inspect uh, the books of accounts that are being kept within that particular company. But also another key right of a partner is that they have a right to share in the profit. So in the absence of any agreement, the partners are entitled to share equally in the profits end and are liable to contribute equally to the losses sustained by the firm. So it's both sides. They have a right to share in the profit, but also they, have, they are equally liable to, share, to have a share if the company makes a loss. So it's not necessarily just looking at the profit, but also it goes to a loss. If the company makes a loss, then they are liable to contribute to that particular loss. And if the company makes a profit, they are liable also, they, they, they have a right to the profit. And it depends on the partnership agreement. Because if in some partnership agreements, all the partners will end up contributing equal resources, equal time, and all that. So because they are, whatever they are contributing is equal, that means they have a right also to uh, they have a right to equal share of whatever profits are coming out of the company. But in some cases, in the agreement, it can be specified in terms of the proportions and the contribution. So if that is specified, that means that will also apply to the profits. If I've contributed 20%, that means I'm, um, I can claim 20% of the profits. If I've contributed 50%, I can also... Uh, I'm eligible to earn 50% of the profit. So, in terms of the right to share in the profit, it depends on the agreement. It depends on what have been agreed, and then that applies to everyone in terms of the agreement. But apart from the rights which they are supposed to enjoy, all those, all those rights that we've looked through, they also have duties. As a partner, you don't just enjoy the rights. So it's more about balancing the rights and obligations. So now we want to talk about what are some of the duties of a partner. The first one is to carry on business to the greatest common advantage. So every partner is bound to carry the business of the firm to the greatest common advantage. Everyone is supposed to participate actively in the management and in the running of the business of the firm. You cannot just be idle and then let other partners do the work for you and at the end of the day you expect to get a share, maybe to share the same, pro the same uh, uh, amount that the others are getting. No. You need to participate. 
So each and every partner is bound to carry on the business of the film with the greatest common advantage. Another duty of a partner is to observe faith. So every partner must be just and faithful. In all the transactions, in all the activities that they do relating to the film, they should make sure that they are performing all those functions, activities, and that with just and faithfulness. Because we are talking about a number of players, two or more partners coming together into a business, to manage a business, to run a business. Now, if there is no faith between the various partners, how can they trust one another? How can they trust the other person to do some activities on, the, on behalf of the others? So if that is to happen, then that means there should be faith. There should be trust. Because when you talk about a partnership, a partnership is based on fiduciary relationship. So, basing on that, they should be faith. They should be um, faithful to one another. So, all the dealings that are to be done in a partnership, everyone should make sure that they are faithful to the other. So, how can a partnership be terminated? So, a partnership termination, we are talking about a way in which a business partnership is legally ended. Because just as a partnership can be started legally, a partnership can also be uh, uh, terminated in a legal way. Or in other, in other cases, a partnership may terminate prematurely due to unexpected circumstances, such as the death of a partner or due to an illegal violation. So, in a normal scenario, in the partnership agreement, there should be a clause that details how that partnership can be terminated. So that should be well clarified in the uh, partnership agreement that is signed by all the partners. So that each and every partner is well aware in terms of what can, what, what can necessitate the termination of all partnership. And when this partnership is being terminated, what are the steps that are supposed to be followed? What are the consequences that then um, imply in terms of termination of the partnership to all the partners? So this needs to be clearly stipulated in the partnership agreement. But also, it is important to note that sometimes partnerships, yes, can be terminated because they've reached their maturity stage and they should be terminated. But in other cases, Partnerships may end up being terminated prematurely. For example, you have a partnership and one of the partners die. So if one of the partners die, automatically the partnership will have to be terminated. Or maybe one of the partners, or in, terms, in case of management of the partnership, there are some illegal violations or there are some illegal actions that have been taken place that have violated even either the partnership agreement or the laws of the country. And because of that, that can also lead to the termination of a partnership. But what is important, as I've said, is to ensure that in the partnership agreement, we clearly stipulate, we clearly specify what should be the conditions in which the partnership can be terminated. That needs to be made clear so that everyone is quite aware in terms of the process that can be used in terms, of, uh, in terms of what can make the partnership to be terminated and what is the process that can be followed in terminating the partnership. So when we are talking about partnerships, we are talking about, you remember, we started with... Um, uh, the partnership corporate entity, non-corporate entity, and then we are moving on to also looking at a corporate business, which is a limited liability partnership. So a corporate business vehicle, this can be referred to as a corporate business vehicle that enables professional expertise and entrepreneurial initiatives to combine and operate in a flexible, innovative, and efficient manner, providing benefits of a limited liability 
or allowing its membership the flexibility for organizing their internal structure as a partnership. So you are trying to incorporate aspects of limited liability into the partnership aspects. That's what this act is all about. So in that case now, we've now moved and progressed to talk about now a company. We've moved away from um, uh, the partnership, we've moved away from the sole proprietorship. Now we want to look at a company. When we talk about a company, what is it all about? So, Companies Act defines a company as something that is formed and registered under the Act. So, any company, if you talk about a company, if you say, I have formed a company, I have a company, that means that institution or that structure needs to be registered under the Act or need to be registered under the existing Company Act. So of the Act also states that an existing company means a company formed and registered under any of the previous companies' law. So you can have an existing company which is already registered, or you can have a new company that is formed. So when you look at it from the Companies Act, when you look at a company from the Companies Act, you will notice that there are some key attributes, you will notice that there are some key issues that comes in when we talk about a company. So a company is now taken as a person. Or oh, when we talk about a company being taken as a person, we are talking about the fact that a company is now taken as a legal body, which can sue and can also be sued. So a company is now regarded as a person, artificial, invisible, intangible and existing only in the contemplation of the law. So a company is taken as a person in, the, in relation to the law, in relation to the company act. And it is artificial, invisible and in, in, intangible. So when you are looking at a company, now you need to refer it or to look at it from the perspective of the company act. Because the company act provides the direction, provides the guidance in terms of what do we mean when we say this is a company? What should be in place for an organization or an institution to be registered as a company? All that is well articulated in the Companies Act. So, what are some of the key characteristics of a company? What distinguishes a company from other part types of partnerships that we've looked through? or from other organizations that are out there. So we are now going to focus on the key characteristics of a company. So when you look at a company, a company is a voluntary association of persons. Voluntary association of persons. So people are associating themselves with each other, but on a voluntary basis. People are associating with each other not to be forced to, to do that. You cannot force people to form a company. No. People form a company on a voluntary basis. People associate as a company on a voluntary basis. That's why one of the key characteristics of a company is that it is a voluntary association. And it is a creation of law. Because a company is based on law. You talk about the Companies Act. You cannot say, I have created a company, yet whatever you have created is against the law. Then that will not be termed as a company. Because the law determines or provides the prescriptions in terms of what a company should be. In terms of what a company should do. In terms of what, the, what should be the structure of the company. How should a company be money? All this is covered under the law. So the law provides a guidance in terms of how you create a company, in terms of how you manage a company. So a company, another key characteristic of a company, it relates to the law. It is a creation of law. It is created based on the law. You cannot create a company that is not in line with the law. And it is incorporated for a specific object only. When you are forming a company, 
you have specific objects that, or specific objectives that you want to achieve by the end of the day. Or you have key performances or key focus areas of actions that the company wants to focus on. So it is incorporated for a specific purpose, for a specific objects, and it will leave, it will do its activities and its, its transaction in relation to those specific objects. And a company has a separate Lego entity because it is, it is separated from the owner. It's not a sole proprietorship when we talk about a company. So as a company on its own, it is a separate Lego entity. It can sue and it can be sold because it is a Lego body. And its members generally have limited liability. We are talking about liability when we started. When you are talking about uh, the sole proprietorship, whereby we are saying that under the sole proprietorship, um, the owner has the liability. But when you talk about the company, there is that separation between the company and the owners. So that's why we say the members of that particular company have limited liability. And its capital, if any, consists of transferable shares. So now you talk about uh, its capital being in a form of shares. And those shares are those shares that are transferable shares. So these are the major characteristics of a company. If we are to gauge an institution, if we are to gauge an organization as being a company, that means that institution or that organization need to align itself to these characteristics. It has to be a voluntary association of persons. And it is supposed to be a creation of the law. And it is supposed to be incorporated for a specific objects only. It has a separate legal entity and its members generally have limited liability and the capital if any, consists of transferable shares. These are the key characteristics of a company. So when you are looking at a company, there are different types of companies. And the classification, when we talk about the classification of companies, it depends on a number of parameters. So you cannot group companies just basing on one classification. But the classification of companies is based on a number of parameters. For example, you can classify companies based on their incorporation. You can classify companies based on their liability. Do they have limited liability or non-limited liability? You can also classify companies based on the number of members. That's another classification. You can also classify companies based on the control of that company. You can also classify uh, a company based on ownership. So you have those one, two, three, four, five classifications. When you talk about the broader classification of company, we are having five broader classification of company according to incorporation, according to liability, according to number of members, according to the basis of control and the basis of ownership. But under all that, you can also have some sub-classification. So first, you move through those, if you talk about the broader classification of companies, you talk about those five that I've talked about as the broader classification of companies. But under each of those, you can also have subclassifications. You can also have subdivisions of companies. For example, if you talk about classification on the basis of incorporation, that is how they have been incorporated. So under that, you can also have two subgroups, whereby you have statutory companies and registered companies. We'll look at this later on. But th just understand that that is the classification that is coming out based on incorporation.
So if we talk about classification of companies based on incorporation, we we'll talk about statutory companies and we also talk about registered companies. Now, you can also classify, as I've said, the companies based on their liability. So, in terms of liability, you have companies with limited liability. And also you have companies with unlimited liability. And that aspect of the companies with limited liability can also be uh, subdivided into companies limited by shares. So you are also having another category. You are also having, sorry, another classification. So in terms of classification, on the basis of liability, you have companies with limited liability and companies with unlimited liability. Moving further to the third classification, which is classification on the basis of number of members. So under the classification on the basis of number of members, it's either you can have private company or you can have public company. You can have private companies owned by individuals and you can have a public company that is owned by the state. So that's classification on the number on the basis of number of member, members. You have private company and you have public company. And from there, you can also have classification on the basis of control. And basing on the classification, on the basis of control, you have what we call as a holding company and we have a subsidiary company. So that is the classification that is coming under the basis of control. And then lastly, we've talked about the classification based on ownership. And when you talk about the classification based on ownership, then you can have either government company or you can have a company that is not owned by the government. So you have government company and companies that are not owned by government. So as you can see, when you talk about classification of company, it's not just a straightforward thing. It is a complicated process for you to classify company. But first, you need to move from the broader classification, and then you move to the specific classification under that broader aspect. So you talk about those five broader classification of companies, and under each one of those, you have subclassification. That's how we, 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 we look at it in terms of classification of companies, or types of companies. So five major classification of companies, and basing on that, we have also sub-classification under each one of the five. So now we want to focus on this now sub-classification, because I think we've already talked about incorporation, we've already talked about liability, we've already talked about number of members and all that. So we want to look at companies basing now on the sub-classification whereby we want to look into detail to say, if we talk about statutory companies, what is a statutory company? What is a registered company? What is a company with limited liability? What is a company with unlimited liability? What is a public or a private company? How can you differentiate a holding company from a subsidiary company? Or how do you differentiate a government company from a non-government company? So that's what we are going to focus on in these slides that we are going to have. So first we start by looking at statutory companies. So what are statutory companies? So when we talk about statutory companies, we are talking about companies that are created by a special act of the legislature. So these are companies that are concerned with public utilities. For example, if you talk about Zesco, Zesco is a statutory company and it is created under a special act of the legislature. And as I've said, these are the companies that are concerned with public utilities. You talk about um, the companies that are involved in the provision of water, like for example, you can talk about the Lusaka Water and Sewerage Company. These are statutory companies. They are companies that are created by a special act of the legislature and they are there to provide 
public utilities. They are there to provide public goods. They are there to provide public services. These are referred to as statutory companies. And apart from statutory companies, we also have what we call as registered companies. So, what are registered companies? These are the type of companies that are formed and registered under the Companies Act and are by far the most commonly found companies, registered companies. Most of the companies that we have are those companies that are registered under the Companies Act. So, statutory companies providing public goods, but these registered companies are more on the, um, uh, those companies that are created under the uh, Companies Act. Then you also have private company. So a private company means a company which is a minimum paid up capital. Uh, you can talk about um, 1 million rands or higher, and by its articles, it restricts the right to transfer its shares. It also limits the number of members to 50. So in a private company, you cannot have more than 50 members. It also prohibits invitation to the public to subscribe for any shares or dependers of the company, and also prohibits any invitation or acceptance of deposits from person other than its members, directors, or their reality. So it is more like a closed company, whereby when you talk about invitation for shares and all that, it's only done by the members, directors, or their relative. It's not an open one. And there is even restriction in terms of number of members. It also restricts the right to transfer of shares. So this is more like a private arrangement. That's why it is referred to as a private company. But from the private company, you can also what we have, what we can call as a public company. So a public company is a company which has a minimum paid up capital, of which is a subsidiary of a company which is not a private company. And when you talk about a public company, it has no restriction on maximum number of membership because it's a public company. So because it's a public company, it is a, an open company in which the number of shares or the number of membership is not limited. Then we also have a holding company. So a holding company is another company which is, uh, it has control over the other company. Holding, you know, like this company, holding is limited. What, what holdings? What happens is that if that company, it's like a much broader company, and within that company, they have other smaller, smaller companies. So it, it's that holding company is the one that is in control of those other companies that are under it. Or those other companies are referred to as subsidiaries. So you are talking about, that's why you hear about a company holdings and its subsidiaries. So you have a company which has other companies within its um, management. So that's what a holding company is all about. And from the holding, we have what is there, what I was talking about, a subsidiary, which is a sub-company of the other company. So a company is known as a subsidiary of another company when its control is exercised by the latter. So the holding company exercises control on the subsidiary company. That's what a subsidiary company is all about. Then from that you have what we call as a government company. So a government company is the one which is not less than 50% of the paid up capital is held by the central government or the state. So when you talk about a government company, it's not only that company whereby you have 50%, whereby you have 100% um, uh, of the uh, uh, paid up capital being paid by the company. No, it's not just at 100%. It's at a minimum of 51%. So if in each and every company whereby 51% of the shares or 51% of the paid up capital is held by the government or the state, then that company will be referred to as a government company. Why is it so? It's because the company has is the majority shareholder in that particular company. 
because the government is having 50, 51%, more than half of the paid up capital in that company. Therefore, the government is a major shareholder. So that's what a government company is all about. Then you also have a non-government company. So when we are talking about a non-government company, we are talking about that company that is operated by private capital. It is not operated by public capital or government capital. It is operated by private capital. So that's what a non-government company is all about. So we can go back to our slide whereby we are looking at the types of companies and we are looking at the classification of companies. So as you can see, we've managed to navigate through this slide whereby we've managed to look at, when you talk about statutory companies, we've looked at statutory companies, we've looked at registered companies. We've also looked at companies with limited liability and companies with unlimited liability. We've looked at private companies, we've also looked at public companies. We've looked at holding companies, we've also looked at the subsidiary companies. We've also looked at government companies, and we've also managed to look at non-government companies. So this is what we've looked at today. Uh, when we meet again for the next session, we'll be able now to start looking at incorporation of companies. If you are to incorporate a company, what is the process that you can follow through? What is it all about when we talk about incorporation of companies? That's where we are going to start from. But as you can see, what we are doing uh, under this one is that we've been trying to set out the, 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 the introduction when we talk about uh, companies in terms of looking at the company, uh, corporate entities. I think we've also looked at non-corporate entities. And we've moved there to look at some of the partnerships. We've looked at sole proprietorship, how it is formed, its advantages. We've looked at partnerships. We've looked at the various characteristics of partnerships, rights of partners, and then we've gone to the company, whereby we've looked at some of the characteristics of the company and the types of companies. So in the next recording or in the next session, we are going to start from looking at incorporation of companies in terms of how companies can be incorporated. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we can stop now for this session. Uh, we'll meet again later in the afternoon.
Ah, ok. Ni oi. It's okay. Kinda kuti kake na ni aka okay okay so good afternoon so thank you so much so today we'll try by all means to look at um, just like a revision for project management I know you'll be doing your first assessment next week so we'll try by all means to look at unit one then unit two because your assessment will only cover those two units. So today what we'll do, we'll try by all means to do a recap of what we discussed in our, uh, in our first unit and also under the second unit. Then it will be easier for us to discuss the key topics under these two units. So when it comes to project management, like the way I put it, in most cases it deals with the aspect to do with you being able to oversee activities relating to a given project or you being able to uh, undertake a number of uh, like let's say uh, works that have related like let's say activities and in most cases since these activities are aimed at the aspect of you being able to achieve goals so at the end of the day in fact it becomes easier now for you to understand fully about how you can spearhead the activities maybe the works that will lead the aspect of you being able to achieve organizational goals in that regard. Okay, so when it comes to project management, I said under Unit 1, we looked much into, um, into issues to do with, like, uh, let's say, defining what projects are, defining what project management is all about. We also looked at concepts of uh, projects, categories of projects, project development cycle, then uh, we looked at the definition of project management. Then uh, we looked at the definition of goals, life cycles. Then we also looked at uh, the project selection methods. Then we also discussed the project portfolio. Then we looked at project formulation. Then we also looked at who a project manager is. Then we discussed also the roles and responsibilities of uh, project managers. Then we also looked at uh, project teams. So these are some of the topics that we looked at under the first unit, and we discussed in detail about what each and every concept and theory is all about under this course called project management. Okay, then uh, when it comes to the second unit, we did look at project organizations, then we looked at conflict management, then we looked at formal organization structure, then we proceeded by looking at organization design, types of uh, organization design, project organizations. Then we also looked at conflict origin and consequences of conflicts in a project or let's say in an organization. Then we also looked at managing conflicts. Then we also proceeded by looking at team methods for resolving conflicts. So these are some of the things that we looked at under the second unit. So we'll proceed by looking at the first unit. So under the first unit, we looked at what project management is all about. We said project management, it is a discipline of planning, organizing, and managing resources to bring about the successful completion of a project or specific project goals and objectives. Then we proceeded by looking at another definition whereby they said project management it looks at the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities in order to meet or exceed stakeholder needs and uh, expectations. So when it comes to project management, we said it will look at all these issues to do with like the knowledge in terms of that project, the skills in terms of that project, the tools in that project, and also the techniques in that project. And then when it comes to the project activities, in order to meet or exceed stakeholder needs and expectations. So when you look at a project, there'll be a number of interested parties that will be involved, and that's why in most cases, you need to look at how they are benefiting from that project, how they are benefiting from that undertake. So in most cases, that's why if I 
project management will play a pivotal role in ensuring at least all the key stakeholders, they do benefit from that project. So when it comes to key stakeholders in a project, we'll look at maybe, let's say, the, the project team, we'll look at maybe the company, the contractors, all those who are involved in that project will be uh, very, very much interested in knowing about how the, the performance is. So we also look at functions of project management. What are some of the functionalities of project management? Since we say this is a very, very rich module, this is a very, very rich course, rather, in most cases, we need to understand the functionalities of project management. So we said the first one is to try to define what a project is. You'll be able to understand fully what is involved in a project, and it will give uh, a clear foundation about projects. Then we also look at project planning. Project management will also allow you to be able to understand issues to do with your planning for projects, you being able to achieve goals for those projects, you being able to allocate resources or funds for those projects. So since a plan will be used as a roadmap, in most cases, in fact, a project plan will enable you or will guide you in terms of how to be able to achieve goals for that project. Then we also looked at project control. So under project control, in most cases, it will include a number of activities that will keep projects moving towards the goal. A project control will also enable you to be able to monitor the activities in that project, for you to be able to monitor in terms of how you are supposed to achieve goals and objectives. So in most cases, that's why it's very, very much pertinent in terms of you as a project manager to understand the aspect to do with what is involved in terms of activities and the nature of goals that needs to be achieved. Because once you start now or implementing those projects, it will be easier for you to be rectifying, to be monitoring those projects, and at the end of the day, it becomes easier for you to understand fully about issues to do with, like, let's say, those <laughs> projects. Okay, then... Uh, okay, then we also looked at uh, um, other functionalities. So we can proceed by looking at now the key importance of project management. Why should you possess certain skills in terms of managing projects? So this is a clear-cut question that needs to run in your minds. So since you are project managers, since you are managers at that level, in most cases, in fact, you need to have certain skills that will enable you to be able to oversee those, like let's say, projects. So when it comes to the importance, the first one is compression of the product life cycle. Then there's global competition. Then we also looked at knowledge explosion, corporate downsizing, then increased customer focus. So when it comes to compression of product life cycle, in most cases, you find once you are well vested in project management, it allows you to be able to look at a number of key stages that will be involved for you to come up with a fully finished product, for you to come up with uh, the aspect of commissioning that product uh, or project. So in most cases, when it comes to product life cycle, we're trying to look at the, the starting time in terms of that project or in terms of that product up to the completion time. So you need to look at the time or the duration that will be involved. So in most cases, you need to make sure at least you're able to compress it and it becomes easier for you to be able to achieve your goals. Then the other one, we're looking at global competition. When it comes to global competition, here we're trying to look at the, uh, the world, how it is currently. You find in most cases there are quite a number of multinational companies. We have a number of companies that are there and it becomes easier for you to be able to understand what is involved under each and every company. So since you're operating in a number of countries, in those countries you'll find that there are a number of projects that are up and running and hence you coming up with that project, it means you need to also stand out and compete. So since there's stiff competition, the competition is so, so high, that's why you need now to see how best you can be able to fit in as a project manager or maybe in terms of your project. Then uh, knowledge explosion. Since we said when it comes to the composition of a project, it will have a number of experts, a number of people who possesses different skills, a number of individuals who are going to, like let's say, uh, foster activities in terms of that organization. Then at the end of the day, it becomes easier for you as an organization to be able to achieve your goals because you would have already 
uh, like let's say, planned and seen how best you can utilize the skill set that you possess. So in a project, you have people who understand about economics, people who are all conversant about finance, people who knows the technical side or engineering side of, let's say, projects. So in most cases, all these things, you've had, they will be considered in issues to do with, uh, uh, like, let's say, uh, companies. Then we have the other one, which is corporate downsizing. So when it comes to corporate downsizing, also if at project management will play a pivotal role, then we have increased customer focus. So when it comes to customer focus, each and every project will look at issues to do with how are you going to satisfy your customers? How are you going to satisfy your clientele? So those are some of the importances of project management. Okay, so we can make some progress. Let's look at the project management process. So the first stage, that is initiation. Then we are planning implementation, controlling, then closing, then this is the last stage under the project management process. So we'll start by looking at initiation process. So when it comes to the first stage, under this stage, this is whereby a company will think of coming up with ideas, will start generating ideas that are related to that activity that they want to undertake. So in most cases, when it comes to projects, it becomes easier now for a company to be able to consider issues to do with, like, let's say, projects and issues to do with, like, let's say, um, activities as a company. So in most cases, when you look at this activity that you want to undertake as a company, there is very much need for you to consider, like, let's say, seeing how best you can be able to do it. You can be able to embrace such activities. So once you come up with ideas to say, now we want to introduce maybe a new detergent paste as a company, or a new beverage as a company, or maybe you want to take, maybe uh, introduce a new brand, maybe when it comes to uh, a given market. So by doing that automatically, it becomes easier for you to be able to understand and uh, look at ways in which you can be able to implement such activities. Then uh, the next stage, once you come up with ideas in terms of what you want to do as a company, you need to look at the planning side or the planning stage. So under the planning stage, this is where by you come up with now a roadmap in terms of how you're going to execute activities in that project, how you're going to achieve, like let's say, goals in that project. So by doing that automatically, it becomes easier for you as a company or maybe as a, an organization to be able to come up with a guide that will enable you in terms of how you're going to allocate funds, in terms of how you're going to recruit, like let's say, individuals who'll be working for that, uh, for that project. Then we we'll also look at issues to do with um, how you are going to be referring resources, all those should be uh, well, well vested in that, uh, like let's say, in that given plan. Then uh, we have also implementation. So under implementation, you are looking at how are you going to put like all the ideas into practice? How are you going to ensure at least you're able to do what to now start performing or practicing that which you want to do in your project? So like even the Zambian government, I think you're able to see a number of projects we have um, uh, the, the PEV Zambia project. We, we had uh, uh, a number of projects in terms of like Link Zambia project. We have a number of infrastructural upliftment projects in terms of like, let's say, uh, uh, facelift of maybe a number of like airports. So in most cases, you need to be able to understand like now, how are you going to measure this? The project should start. Then controlling process is whereby now, once you start with your project, you're able to monitor and see whether maybe you are deviating from the required or requirements. And uh, in most cases, this is what uh, it leads to the aspect of a project failing if maybe you don't have a good controlling system in place. Then closing, this is where by now you're able to commission the project, you're able to come to the end of the project, then you're able now to come up with the exact or the actual product in that regard. Okay. So... We also look at what a project is. We said a project can be an undertake that involves goal orientation. Then it also look at the commitment of various skills and also resources that will be considered in terms of you trying to achieve those objectives and also goals. Okay, so in most cases when it comes to... Um, Okay, so in okay, so in most cases when it comes to projects, they will look at a number of like let's say resources that will be required for you to be able to achieve your like let's say your goals in that regard. So in most cases that's why when you see a number of companies, 
They will try by all means to take much of their time looking at all these activities that will be considered in terms of these projects. Okay. Then uh, we also said a project can be defined as a package of time-bound, scheduled, and also assembled activities dedicated to the attainment of a specific objective of successful completion of work on time and also within the allotted budget. So in most cases when it comes to these projects, it becomes easier for you as a company to be able to understand what is involved because you would have already come up with the budget in terms of the finances that you require, okay, the resources that are needed, and at the end of the day, it becomes easier for you to be able to achieve all those objectives in that regard. Okay, then now uh, when it comes to the next one, in fact, we're trying to look at the characteristics of a project. So the key characteristics of a project, okay, so the first one, we're trying to look at uh, every project should uh, have a set of objectives, or maybe let's say a mission whose achievement marks project completion. So once you complete a project, that is a plus. That is a side that looks at the aspect of you being able now to achieve what you had uh, stipulated earlier on. Okay. Okay. Then uh, we can also look at a project must have uh, a project commencement and also completion time. So in most cases, when you look at all these, you find that it allows a project to be able to like maybe run for some time. So in most cases, when you look at a certain projects that do not have a time limit or that are not time bound, it becomes difficult for you to know when you're supposed to execute or when you're supposed to commission or let's say complete that program. So that's why in most cases, it becomes a, uh, a challenge. So when it comes to certain projects, I can give an example like when the, like the government or maybe a company is trying to expand its, uh, uh, its plant, in most cases, they'll say maybe this project is for six months. So within six months, you need to make sure at least you're able to do what? You're able to ensure at least that project comes to an end or maybe it's completed. Because the more time that you take, especially when it comes to you not maybe meeting the required time limit, at the end of the day, for now, it becomes an expense, it becomes an, uh, a cost because now you need to pay more or you need to pay much in terms of like those projects. Then a project should have also a number of participants. I told you to say there'll be a number of individuals who enable you to be able to undertake, like let's say, those activities in that regard. Okay. Then we also looked at uh, a project. Okay, we said a project should also call for teamwork or let's say uh, cooperation in that regard. So in most cases, you need to ensure at least as a project team or as a project um, that is... Uh, spearheading as well of you being able to achieve number of, of goals as a company, you need to look at now how are you going to measure this. You remain professional, you remain competent, there's interpersonal relations in that regard. Okay. Then uh, the other one, every project should be unique. Then the project should be subject to change because when you look at how the global village is, how the business world is, it keeps on evolving, it keeps on changing, technology keeps on changing. So at the end of the day, you need to now look at how are you going to ensure at least you're able to adjust yourself and uh, cope up with those changes that are being made. Then now uh, we also looked at issues to do with a project should always look at customer specific. Okay, it should look at now being able to discuss or look at now what customers wants and needs are. In terms of you being able to satisfy these customers, you being able to satisfy these consumers, then a project also requires teamwork. Okay, so let's look at types of projects. So when it comes to projects, in most cases, you find you're looking at new projects, expansion projects, modernization projects, then there's diversification projects. Then the other one is other projects. You find a number of projects, maybe sectoral projects, long or short-term projects. There are quite a number of projects that you'll be able to find. So now let's try to look at the first one, which is new projects. So when it comes to new projects, these are projects that are done for the first time, a company maybe wants to introduce a new product. Maybe a company wants to undertake a certain activity that has never been undertaken before. So in most cases, it will lead to the aspect of like the company being able to spearhead the new technology in that regard. Then expansion projects whereby once you come up with those new projects, there will be a time whereby you're looking at economies of scale. Once you're not satisfied now, you'll be able to look at how are you going to maximize on the output. Then there's expansion projects, then uh, modernization projects, 
diversification projects than other projects. So modernization projects is whereby you are trying to adopt new technology, you are trying to modernize or maybe automate all your production, or let's say uh, the machinery in terms of like your, your company. Then diversification is whereby you want to consider like you being able to uh, start producing or considering certain or different products as compared to what you're doing as a company. I can give an example. If maybe your company is an insurance company, then you want to consider also financial services. You find you start diversifying from insurance-oriented services to finance-oriented services to medical-oriented services. I think you've seen what a number of, uh, like let's say, um, uh, num a number of companies, what they are doing, especially non-banking financial institutions. They'll try to embrace a number of, like let's say, services, and once they diversify, automatically it becomes easier for them to be able to make money and remain relevant in their industry of operation. Then under other projects, you find a number of projects like short-term projects, long-term projects. We, gov uh, we have sectoral projects. So name it. So in most cases, this is what happens. Then levels of project analysis. I said in most cases, you find there are quite a number of levels that you'll find in terms of le uh, project decision making. So you can make a decision at national level sectoral level and also you can uh, make a decision under the project level so when it comes to national level this is whereby a country or a state or a government can look at priority areas or sectors like let's say agriculture mining tourism okay manufacturing so name it so in most cases once they look at all these sectors then they'll say we need to spear ahead a number of activ activities because you look at the sector that you think is a hub in terms of economic development and which will lead to economic emancipation. So in most cases, that's why you need to think in those lines in terms of you being able to do it, to make decisions related to projects. Then there's also sectoral level. So under sectoral level, this is whereby you make now decisions that are related to uh, a sector. Maybe it's a manufacturing sector, it's a tourism sector, it's a banking sector, it's a finance sector. So in most cases, it becomes easier in that regard, and that's why as a company, you need to spearhead such activities. Okay. Then you need to look at project level, where now individual projects are identified, prepared, okay, and implemented. Then uh, you can also look at now uh, a company maybe trying to come up with expansion plan or maybe expansion projects. So in most cases, what they can do under the project is whereby you look at the project itself under the company or maybe under the contractors that have been contracted by the government, uh, like let's say the government of Zambia. So in most cases, I can give an example, like uh, we have uh, the road construction projects, whereby we have uh, a number of contractors like AVIC International. So in most cases, when you look at Zambia, it will try by all means to be able to monitor or look at the decisions that are made by AVIC International at project level, then at the end of the day, it will be going at under sector level, whereby they'll look at the road sector and it will be easier for you to be able to assess how you are faring in that regard. Okay, then uh, let's look at some of the facets of project analysis. You know, when you're assessing projects, when you're evaluating how projects are performing, in most cases, you need to look at issues to do with, uh, like let's say the facets of project analysis. So in most cases, in fact, you look at technical analysis. Under technical analysis, you're looking at the engineering side of like let's say your project in terms of the location, in terms of the plans, in terms of the technology that is required, in terms of like the machinery or the mechanism of production. Okay, then now uh, we have uh, the other one whereby you're looking at economic analysis, whereby you can be looking at issues to do with how to allocate scarce resources among main competing needs, or maybe sometimes you can look at how you can meet the demand in that regard. So these are under like economic analysis. So when it comes to economic analysis, in most cases, you need to look at how stable is the economy for that given country. How are you going to ensure at least you're able to do it to meet your objectives in that given country? Because mind you, when it comes to projects, since you are spending money, since you are investing heavily, that's why you need to make sure at least in that country the stability in terms of their income, in terms of their GDP, in terms of their currency, and this becomes easier in that regard for you to excel in your business. Okay. Then we can look at financial analysis. So this is the major question that is normally asked in terms of funding. So you need to ensure at least when it comes to your project that you're trying to undertake or to do, you should have like let's say adequate finances or funding to ensure at least it becomes easier for you 
to be able to achieve your goals in that regard. Then there's also social analysis, whereby you're able now to assess the project, you're able to assess now, like let's say the design, you're able to assess also whether maybe people are benefiting, especially people in that given community. Because when it comes to projects, I can give you an example, like when you look at the Nico uh, mine, uh, or the Munali Nico mine, okay, sometimes they'll call it Abidon. In most cases, when you look at that mine, when they're trying to come up with that mine, they were supposed to do are to displace people in that given area. So since you are displacing people, in most cases what happens is that it becomes now um, easier for you to be able to know how you can look at issues to do with uh, uh, issues to do with you being able to do what to save or maybe ensure that the people in that given area are able to benefit massively in terms of those given projects. Then there's institutional analysis whereby now you look at developmental projects, okay, and also in terms of the quality of institutions responsible for them, okay. Then environmental uh, analysis whereby you look at now whether you are conserving the environment, whether you are not maybe uh, exploiting the resources, okay, whereby certain resources can even run into extinction if you're not careful as a company. So that's why in most cases it's important for you as an organization to look at issues to do with you meeting the, uh, like let's say, the uh, regulations, you being able to do what to follow the regulations in terms of environmental regulations of a given country, and by doing that automatically, then it becomes easier for an organization to be able to survive. I can give an example. If maybe you have a project, and that project is leading to soil erosion, it's leading to exploitation or of exploitation of renewable resources like fisheries, in most cases, maybe sometimes pollution. Like in Zambia, you have Zambia Environmental Management uh, Agency, Zema, whereby they'll come in. Then they'll take you to task in terms of your organization or your project. So that's why you need to be mindful. You look at all these issues. Then managerial capacity, this one is done to look at your team, your project team. Are they qualified enough for them to be able to execute the duties or maybe the tasks or assignments in that given project? Then when it comes to project life cycle, I said for each and every project, it should have a duration, the starting time, and also the completion time. So since there's a duration that is involved, when it comes to a project life cycle, from the time you commence, from the time you started your project, you need to look at now the time that will be taken for you to complete and also commission that project. So if your project is taking four months, in most cases that's your product project life cycle. And it will involve a number of stages whereby you look at the initial stage, the maturity stage, until you're able to commission that project. So when it comes to the project life cycle, there'll be a number of stages that will be involved. So the first one is idea generation or idea conception or idea or project co uh, identification. So under this stage, this is where by now you're able to identify or come up with project ideas that will represent the high priority use of the country's organization's resources to achieve important developmental projects. So this is what happens. Okay, then uh, project preparation or definition so this is a phase in which the project concept is given concrete shape by describing the project with more detail. So in most cases, this is what happens, and it becomes easier because you'd have now started preparing in terms of what is required in that project. In terms of, like, let's say, you sourcing materials that will be yours in that project in that regard. Then uh, we have um, the other phase, which is uh, the project organization phase. So this follows the project definition phase and it involves the preparation of the project execution plan. So with the following components. So the first one, establishing infrastructure and services. Then we have project engineering and also design. Then staff recruitment and appointment of a project manager. These are some of the things that will be involved under this phase when it comes to the project life cycle. Then there's project implementation. So this is the phase whereby the project activities actually takes place. It involves verification of project equipment and machinery, specification, placing orders with vendors for project inputs, inviting bids from contractors. Uh, okay. Then we have also project shutdown. Okay, cleanup phase whereby now you come to the end of the project and you're able now to implement. Okay, so this is how the life cycle for a project looks like. Then when it comes to what are some of the project selection methods? How can you select a project? So there are quite a number of methods that you can use. 
when it comes to you selecting a project for your company, for your country, or for a given state. So the first method is what we call benefit measurement method. So when it comes to this method, in most cases, it's a technique that is based on the present value of the estimated cash flow or outflow and inflow. So cost benefits are calculated and then compared to other projects to make a decision. So this is what happens in most cases. In fact, you have a number of projects. Let's say you want to expand your plant. You want to introduce a new product. You want to maybe introduce a new brand. So at the end of the day, you need to now start calculating to say which project is going to make your company, like let's say, make profits. Okay. Then we have uh, the benefit or cost ratio. So when it comes to the benefits or cost ratio, this is a name that suggests that the ratio between the present value of inflow or like let's say cost invested in a given project to the present value of outflow. So this is the value of return from the project. Okay. Then now uh, we have economic model. Also this one, it will look at issues to do with uh, the net profit after you deduct the taxes and also the expenditure. Then at the end of the day, you're trying to look at now wealth creation of an organization or the worthiness. So this will allow you to be able to perform. Then we have the scoring model in project management, whereby you can be scoring projects in terms of coming up with marks. So the, the, the projects that get highest scores, you find now you're able to select it as a company or as a country. Then we have the payback period, whereby you're looking at the number of years, the number of months that it will take in terms of you recovering the money that you invested in that business. Okay. Then net present value. Then uh, under net present value here, trying to look at the difference between the project's current value of cash inflow and the current value of cash outflow. Then we also look at discounted cash flow, whereby it is uh, well known uh, that the future value of money will not be the same as today. So normally you need to look at issues to do with discounting. So if maybe you are expecting, like let's say, 20,000 in future, you need to make sure at least you discount by looking at maybe 15,000. So at least the 5,000 should be considered for any changes, ad adjustments or fluctuations that may arise. Then internal rate of return, the internal rate uh, of return, this is the interest rate at which the net present value is zero attained when the present value of outflow is equal to the present value of inflow in that regard. Okay, then opportunity cost, this is where you're looking at now, you're being able to oversee the current opportunity for you to be able to consider another one. I can give an example whereby you've got a project underway, then you find out to say there's also an opportunity or maybe a business that you can undertake. So you can even oversee what you're doing currently and look at now the future in that regard. Then constraint methods here whereby you're looking at maybe some that can use algorithms, syntax, and also mathematical calculations. Like let's say you can use um, simultaneous equations, arithmetics, for you to be able to come up with uh, the actual project that you think will make sense. Then also non-financial considerations whereby you can look at issues to do with maybe, <coughs> uh, rather issues to do with like let's say factors in terms of organizational goals, you want to what you want to achieve. And uh, at the end of the day, you're not just like looking at the profit making only. Then uh, a project manager under unit one, we also looked at a project manager. We said, this is a person who have certain skills that will enable him to oversee a certain uh, project. So under this project manager, we said, you need to look at leadership, the technical side, the conflict management, and also customer relationship in that regard. Then we also look at this uh, responsibilities of a project manager. So in most cases at this level, whereby you are master's students, there's no need for you to memorize. It's just a matter of understanding the concept. Then you apply. So imagine if you know who a project manager is. You're not supposed to study or start maybe panicking to say, what are some of the responsibilities of this person? So when it comes to a project manager, since we say this is a person who oversee, a person who be able to do it, to take charge of the project team. So in most cases, it becomes easier now for you to be able to understand. So they will direct all activities in terms of making sure the project is successful. They will scan ahead of potential issues. They also recommend issues to do with uh, alternative approaches to problems. Then also track and report project progress. Communicate to also stakeholders in terms of projects. Then uh, initiating, planning, execution, controlling, monitoring, and also closing down projects. These are some of the responsibilities of a project, uh, project manager. Then we also looked at why do you think certain projects have failed in Zambia, have failed in a number of companies, and uh, what leads to those uh, projects to be able to fail. So the first one we said poor project and uh, program management discipline. 
lack of executive level support. We also looked at uh, poor communication. Then we also looked at no measures for evaluating the success of a project. So these are some of the points that will lead to a project failing. I think you've seen a number of projects like in the country whereby instead of the projects being completed or commissioned, at the end of the day, it leads those projects to be white elephants, whereby as a company or as a country, you fail to actualize the results or let's say the benefits of those projects. I can give an example, like let's say when you look at the Mulungushi textiles in Kabwe, we find that project was a good project, but look at it. Okay, we have failed to commission or maybe to measure this. The project is up and running. Look at the number of projects in the country whereby we've abandoned them, and at the end of the day, it becomes difficult for a country to be talking about national revenue, for a country to be talking about national income, for the company to be talking about GDP because of certain sectors that are still, like let's say, limping or paralyzed in that manner or crippled. Okay, then we are looking at the first one, which is poor project and program management. When the project is not maybe well managed, in most cases that project will fail to do what? To be completed. Then there's lack of executive level support. In most cases when you come to the topmost level, if maybe you don't have blessings from the topmost or let's say the managers at the helm, it becomes difficult for you to excel because those are the overall decision makers and in as much as you've got a nice team, a good team, at the end of the day, if maybe the project is not well supported by the management or the people at the helm, automatically it becomes a challenge. Then there's wrong team members, whereby sometimes when you're selecting those team members, you didn't select that member team, uh, rather that team not on merit, maybe it was just done due to nepotism, maybe due to tribalism, maybe due to other means in terms of bribery or corruption. At the end of the day, but it will cost you as a project manager because those people will fail to work. Imagine whereby you're trying to look at a technical project, then I start employing people who don't have like maybe an engineering background. Automatically, but it will be so difficult for them to excel if maybe you don't consider such in that regard. Then there's poor communication also will lead to failures in terms of projects. So there are instances whereby a project will fail because there was no clear-cut communication that was done or made. And once you do that, because I told you earlier on to say there'll be a project team, that team should be able to do it, to get updates and also feedback in terms of how you're faring, how you're progressing in that project. So if maybe you fail to do that, automatically you find there will be crippling in terms of communication, then you won't be able to achieve your goals as an organization. So no measures for evaluating the success of the project. Okay, then no risk management, then inability to manage change. Okay, so measuring project success, in most cases you look at the project cost scope, project cost, schedule, then customer satisfaction. Okay, so these are some of the golden rules that you find. Then project team, we also said, no matter, we're looking at a number of members that will be working towards achieving goals in a given project. Okay, then uh, we said that uh, a, a project team will have a number of people, like project executive, manager, experts, we have uh, the, the project assistant job, the project planner, and the team manager in that regard. So structure of a project team, this is just an example of a structure of a project team. So this is how the first unit looks like. Then uh, we'll be able to proceed to the next unit. We already looked at unit two. We completed also the key topics under this unit. So under the second uh, unit, we also looked at a number of like, let's say topics like project organization. We looked at uh, conflict management. We looked at formal organizational structure. Then we also looked at organization design. Then we looked at types of project organizations. Then we also looked at conflict and consequences of conflicts. Then we also proceeded by looking at um, managing conflicts, then team methods for resolving conflicts. Okay, so let's try to look at what a project organization is. So we said a project organization, we'll look at now, um, and like let's say a team of members that will be working uh, in a certain structure or in a certain system in the term, uh, so in terms of achieving goals for a given project. So it is just a system that will harmonize activities in a given project in that regard. So when it comes to a project, if I, since it's a permanent functional structure, drawing specialists and workers from various functions or functional departments who work under the overall leadership, so when it comes to project definition, a project organization is preferred 
means whenever a well-defined project must be dealt with or the task is bigger than anything in terms of like the organization. Then now uh, the chart for project organization, this is the example okay, that you can find in terms of how a project organization looks like. Since I told you to say we're looking at the composition of members, okay, activities, okay, resources that will be used in the aspect of like that project and uh, in overall we're looking at it as a project organization because this is a project um, or this is will be uh, so this is uh, an organization that will be charged with the responsibility of overseeing activities in that given project. Okay, then now uh, we looked at merits of project organization whereby we said we're looking at concentrated attention on project work, advantages of team specialization, ability to cope with environmental influences, then timely completion of the project. Then uh, we also looked at uh, some of the limitations of project organizations. We said there are problems of coordination, especially when uh, there are different people from different cultures, different people from different specializations of, of or, or let's say area of study. Then we have feeling of insecurity, then duplication of uh, efforts. Then we also looked at types of project organizational structure. Okay, so these are some of the things that we, we, we looked at. Okay, so there are also like the, the types of project organizational structure. So we looked at uh, uh, a number of projects who have different structures. So the, the first one is what we call functional projects or let's say project organizational structure. There's project oriented, then there's matrix, project organization, then composite uh, project organization. Okay, then uh, we also looked at functional object uh, organizational or project organization. We said this is a structure where you find projects that involve a number of departments or a number of units in an organization. So in that regard, in most cases, it becomes easier for a company to be able to deal with issues to do with uh, consulting from other departments in terms of coming up with, uh, or let's say, achieving goals for that uh, project. So when it comes to functional organizations, they're saying it's divided along functional lines, that is, each division or department organized by work type, such as engineering, production, sales. So in most cases, these projects are initiated, initiated and also executed by divisional 
managers. So this is what happens under a functional project, whereby there are certain projects that require the production team, projects that require the sales team, projects that require the finance team. And at the end of the day, it becomes easier for them to be able to know what to do in that regard. Then uh, this is how a functional organizational structure looks like for a project or maybe let's say a functional project organization. Then uh, project oriented, on the other end, we find the scale is the project oriented organization. These companies do most of their work on a project basis and are therefore structured in around projects. So in most cases when it comes to project oriented organizational structures, so in most cases these structures, they will look at issues to do with the actual project that you are doing, that you are executing. If maybe it's a marketing project, then it means it will look at now the actual marketing activities only. If maybe, <coughs> excuse, so if maybe maybe it's an engineering, let's say, project, in most cases it will look at now the engineering side of the business and it will see how best, let's say, a company can be able to, like let's say, uh, achieve its goals in terms of that given project. Okay, then uh, we also looked at uh, uh, matrix, we said the matrix normally it's a hybrid whereby it will bring the functional and also the project oriented together. So since we said the project oriented, it look at now the actual nature of the project then and also it will also involve a number of departments. Then that combination is what we call um, matrix. But the composite is whereby it will involve all the three forms of uh, organizations. Then we also looked at what a formal organization is. So we said a formal organization looks at the delegation of authority relationships among its organizational members. <coughs> okay, it works along uh, with predefined set of policies, plans, procedures, schedules, and programs. So most of the decisions in formal organizations are based on predetermined policies. Okay, then we also looked at uh, uh, formal organization system. So we said a formal organization is a system of well defined jobs, each bearing a definite measure of authority, responsibility, and the accountability. Okay, then we also looked at uh, the features of uh, formal organizations. We said they have a deliberately created structure, job-oriented, division of work, then departmentization. Then uh, merits of formal organization, we said why you need to ensure this in project management, you will promote aspect of you being formal. The first one, it clearly defines objectives of the organization. Then it results in optimal utilization of scarce resources. Then division of work and relationships. Then organizational hierarchy avoids overlapping of activities, which is also a plus or maybe a merit. Then limitations of formal organization. So there's loss of initiation, initiative, unsatisfied social needs. Then uh, there is conflict management under the second unit also. So when it comes to conflicts, mostly you are looking at a clash of interests, values, actions, views, or directions. So conflict refers to the existence of that clash, or conflict is initiated, uh, the instant clash occurs, or conflict is an outcome of organizational intricacies, interactions, and also disagreements. Okay, so when it comes to conflicts, these uh, should not be entertained in projects because since a number of individuals have a dispute or they are disagreeing, they need to now see how best they can be able to agree on certain uh, projects or areas. So why conflicts arise in projects? People disagree, people are concerned with fear or force, then there's issues to do with uh, uh, the conflict process. So the conflict process, you look at issues to do with the conflict situation, <laughs> maybe people are fighting, then you need to look at awareness of the situation, how uh, informed are you about <laughs> what is happening maybe in that given project or maybe among those workers. Then there's realization, then the manifestation of the conflict, then resolution or suppression of the conflict, then after effects of the conflict situation. Then uh, positive effects of conflicts. In most cases when you look at conflicts also, they've got certain pros and uh, uh, merits. So in most cases we find this diffusion of more serious conflicts, sim uh, stimulation of a search for new facts, then in case or increase in group cohesion and performance, then assessment of power or ability. Then uh, we have a theory of conflict management. We have the traditional one whereby you look at the uh, issues to do with uh, conflicts arising from trouble makers. But the contemporary theory normally looks at natural causes that are unavoidable in terms of 
na issues to do with like let's say uh, human beings being able to fight in terms of natural results, in terms of competition at work, in terms of uh, promotions, transfers, all those things. Then now uh, we also looked at methods of managing conflicts. How can you manage conflict? So we looked at styles, you can look at behavioral styles. We looked at improving organizational practices. Then we also looked at special roles and structures. Then confrontation techniques. Then we also proceeded by looking at staying calm then communication and also listening between parties. Then uh, we also looked at acknowledging the conflict and find a resolution, whereby once you understand to say there's a conflict, then you can look at how you can settle that conflict. Then uh, involve leadership or HR. So in most cases, if I here, you're able now to see how you can resolve that issue with uh, those people in a given project. Okay, so I think we've tackled a number of key topics that will be considered in your uh, first assessment. So just make sure at least you're able to look at all these topics in detail, then it becomes easier for you to understand what is involved under each and every, like let's say, project. So project management, I think you saw under the first uh, unit, we looked at the introductory part whereby we're looking at more of the theories then under the second unit, we try to look at now the implementation side when it comes to projects, how you can be able to apply or how you can be able to do it to ensure at least you're able to do it, you're able to consider implementing those projects. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much for the session. So just prepare adequately for your first assessment. So in most cases, we'll bring key topics under the, the coverage that we've done. So thank you so much, wishing you the very best. And um, you need to consider that aspect of you making sure at least you understand all these concepts, the theories. I know most of you are already working. Most of you, you are business or prominent businessmen and women. So in most cases, it's about you being able to apply uh, what we are talking about. So thank you so much. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.
Okay, welcome to this session. We are going to continue where we stopped last time. Uh, now we are going to look at incorporation of companies. So I think that's where we are going to start from. Uh, if you recall, the last session that we had, we were looking at the various types of companies. So we looked at the classification of companies. I think that's where we stopped. So for now, we are going to start from the aspect of incorporation of companies, looking at ways in which companies can be incorporated. So, first we start by looking at whatever we've talked about to say when we talk about a company, from the legal perspective, a company is an artificial person. So, a company is, from the legal person, the legal perspective, taken as an artificial person, but it is created through a legal procedure. So that artificial person is created through a legal procedure. You cannot have that artificial person without going through the legal procedure. So um, company is an official person created by following a legal pro procedure. And before you even start of thinking of establishing a company, or before the formation of a company, there is a lot of thinking, a lot of groundwork, a lot of preliminary work that needs to be done. So it's not just that easy that in a day you can just say, I've formed a company, I've registered a company. No, because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. There is a lot of uh, preliminary underground work that needs to be undertaken. And when you talk about this preliminary work or this lengthy process of formation of a company, it can be divided into four stages. So if you are to form a company, the preliminary activity, the preliminary works that you can undertake in forming your company can be categorized into four major activities or four major distinct stages. So we have four major stages which are promotion, incorporation or registration, capital subscription, and commencement of a business. So these are the procedures for the incorporation of a company. When we talk about promotion, it's that initial aspect whereby you are thinking about the company, you are developing the company idea, you are developing the business idea, you are thinking through in terms of how will that company uh, be established and be promoted, what will be the core values, the, the core activities of the company, and all that. That goes through that same promotional cycle. Then from the pro promotional phase, now you go through the incorporation or registration phase. This is now that phase whereby you need to go through the legal registration process so that your company now becomes a legal entity, so that your company now becomes that artificial legal person, which can be sued or which can also sue. So that's what the incorporation or the registration is all about. You need to make sure that you have all the documents that are required for your incorporation, and sometimes you even need to have lawyers that will help you to draft the documents. Uh, you need to uh, go to the uh, office responsible for the incorporation of companies to get information on um, what is needed for incorporation, and you need to make sure that you have everything that is required for incorporation. So that's the second phase or second stage. From that second stage, now you go to the third stage, which is about capital subscription. Now it's about that time that you are looking at in terms of capital, in terms of shares, in terms of how are you going to raise the required capital, uh, how are you going to manage the shares and all that that relates to your business. So people can now come in to buy shares to subscribe their capital into the company because it has now been incorporated or it has now been reg registered. It is now a legal body. You can use the registration certificate. You even go to the bank. They can open uh, 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 a bank uh, account for you because now the company is a legal entity. It has been registered. It has been incorporated. So you can now move to that stage of capital subscription. From that stage of capital subscription, now you move to the other stage, which is about the commencement of the business. Now everything is set. Now you can start to undertake 
the business that you are supposed to undertake. So this is the procedure for incorporation of companies. When you talk about how you can incorporate companies, this is the procedure that can be followed for the incorporation of companies. So, if you talk about companies, because you remember, we talked about companies where by now you have shareholders, we have directors, we have, you have now a number of uh, persons that are now part of that particular company. So, because a company being an artificial person created by law and having a separate entity distinct for its members, it is very important to find out ways in which decisions will be made. Because being an artificial person, the company cannot take its own de decision because it's an artificial person. So you need to come up with modalities. You need to come up with ways in which the various decisions that are important for the management of that particular company are made. So those decisions basically are made through convening of various meetings. And we we'll look at a number of meetings that can be convened for different purposes in companies. So it has to take decisions on matters relating to its well-being by way of resolutions passed at properly constituted and convened meetings of its shareholders and directors. So there should be meetings of shareholders. There should be meetings of directors where by now decisions will be made, where by now resolutions will be made in a, through a properly constituted and convened meeting. So this section, we are going to look at the various meetings that are supposed to take place within the company setting. So when we talk about corporate meetings, there are some requirements or some essentials that are there that can make a meeting to be valid. Because sometimes in a company, you can go ahead to have a meeting. And then maybe you pass some resolutions out of that meeting. But if you've not followed the proper conditions or the, you've not met the necessary conditions for a valid meeting, those resolutions will end up being cancelled or invalidated because they were made at a meeting which has not been properly constituted or organized. So it is very important to, to know what are some of the key issues that are essential for a meeting to be valid. Because if these conditions are not met, then by the end of the day, the company meeting will not be valid. The, it's not only the meeting that will be taken as not being valid, but even the resolutions that will, by the end of the day, be passed from that uh, meeting, those resolutions will also be invalidated. So to avoid a waste of time and all the complications that can come in because of the invalidation of um, resolutions of a meeting, it is very important to ensure that the essential requirements for a valid meeting are met. The first essential requirement is about the right convening authority. Right convening authority. So when we talk about each and every meeting, it's not each and every person who can convene a meeting. So it is very important for a meeting to be declared as valid that it must be constituted or convened by a proper authority. Because otherwise, if the meeting is not um, uh, convened by a proper authority, that meeting will lose its validity. And that meeting will be taken as an invalid meeting. So in terms of company law, the company secretary is the proper authority to call for a formal meeting. So the company secretary has the obligation. The company secretary has the mandate to call for a meeting. So it is very important to ensure that for each and every corporate meeting, you take into consideration the issue of the right of convening authority. Right convening authority. You should make sure that the right convening authority should convene that particular meeting. Another aspect is about proper notice. So duly signed notice must be submitted to members before the meeting. The place of the meeting, time and date must be stated in the notice. So in most of the, uh, in the corporate world, 
there will even be specification to say, maybe for a board meeting, maybe for this meeting, you need to give out uh, a notice for the meeting. The notice of the meeting need to be given maybe within such, such a period so that people have time to prepare for the meeting. And the notice of the meeting should be able to indicate the meeting, the place of the meeting, the time of the meeting, the date, and all that. That should be in the uh, notice of the meeting. So it is very important to ensure that a proper notice is made for that particular meeting. And all the people that are concerned are aware, aware and have received that uh, notice. And that notice should be duly signed. So it's not just sending a notice that is not signed. But that notice should be duly signed. And also proper publicity of agenda. It's not about just sending a notice. But you need to make sure that the agenda is well articulated and also all the members are informed about the agenda. Because if you don't know the agenda of the meeting, how do you prepare for such a, a meeting? And we are not talking about any other meeting. We are talking about corporate meeting, whereby you need to go to the meeting with information, with data, well prepared, and all that. So you need to have a proper agenda. So every member of the meeting should be properly informed of the agenda of the meeting. That's another important aspect that will make a meeting valid. Another aspect that will make a corporate meeting valid is the issue of the quorum. Because in each and every, in the articles of incorporation, the constitution of a company, the bylaws of a company, there is a specification in terms of how many members should be available for a meeting to be valid. So it is very important to ensure that a meeting should be conducted when the column has been made. Because if the column has not been made and a meeting is constituted, the resolutions that are passed through that meeting can easily be challenged. They can end up not being legally binding because they are the resolutions that have been made from a meeting whereby the column was not made. So for a valid meeting, requisite column is necessary. The meeting should not be started until the required number of the members are present. So make sure that the members are present. That's why in most of these meetings, before starting the meeting, the chairperson of the meeting will check whether the column has been made or not. If the column has not been made, then the meeting cannot proceed because you need to have a column. Otherwise, if you don't have a column, you end up wasting a lot of time and effort. Another aspect is about presence of light persons. So only regular members can, present, can be present in the meeting. If it's a board meeting or if it's a particular executive meeting, it's a, if it's a meeting of directors, only those who are authorized to attend those meetings, only those who are legally uh, allowed to attend the meetings should be made to attend. So if there is an unauthorized person in the meeting, the meeting will end up losing its validity because there is an intruder in the meeting. So make sure that when conducting corporate meetings, only the right persons should attend those meetings. And also the proper presiding officer should be available. The meeting should be presided by a proper presiding officer. Most of the time, the chairman of a valid meeting must be a proper person. So in most of the organization, it will be, they will clarify to say, for a meeting, maybe it should be chaired by the chairperson, or this should be chaired by this director. This should be. So make sure that the presiding officer should be a proper presiding officer. Otherwise, the meeting will end up losing its validity. Another aspect is that the meeting should be conducted in line with the agenda. A valid meeting must be done according to the agenda that was developed and circulated to the members. You cannot just come in now and start bringing in issues that are not part of the agenda and making resolutions and agreements out of that. No, that will not be acceptable. That can make that meeting to lose its validity. 
So it is very important to ensure that the discussions in that meeting are done according to the agenda. All the discussions that are done should be done according to the agenda. Make sure that you are not including things that are not related to the agenda. Because if things that are not related to the agenda are included, this will make the meeting to lose its validity. So, one of the key issues that we talked about here was that the meeting should be presided by the right person, or we are talking about the chairperson of the meeting. So, what are some of the roles or functions or duties of a chairperson of a meeting? So, as a chairperson or the presiding officer of a meeting, that person do have a number of specific roles and duties that they are supposed to perform. So, we are going to look at these duties. We are going to look at these functions that are supposed to be performed by the chairpersons of a meeting. First is arranging the time and the place. So the chairperson has the responsibility to arrange in terms of where should the meeting take place, at what time should the meeting take place. And you know all these are supposed to be included in the notice for invitation for the meeting. The secretary is there just to send out the invitation. But the secretary is not there to decide in terms of the time and the place of the meeting. This is supposed to be decided by the chairperson. The chairperson has also the function of preparing and serving an agenda. So the preparation of the agenda is also the responsibility of the chairperson. And once the agenda is prepared, the chairperson has the responsibility to ensure that the agenda is circulated to all the members, that all the members do have a copy of the agenda. And also calling the meeting to order on time. If the meeting is supposed to start at such, such a time, when it's time, the chairperson is the one who has the mandate, the chairperson is the one who has the responsibility to call the meeting to order. And also has the responsibility to make clear the purpose of the meeting. Inform the members at the beginning why you are meeting, what is the purpose of the meeting. That needs to be well articulated before the starting of the meeting or at the start of the meeting. Another responsibility or duty of the chairperson of a meeting is to ensure that they keep the discussion on course. Because now you have a wide range of people in a meeting, maybe 10 members, for example or, yeah, 10 members, it's a board meeting, then the chairperson, then what will happen is there will still be issues for discussion, and sometimes you have other people pushing this issue, the other side, others, the other side, and this and this, and sometimes you cannot make progress. So it is the role or the function of the chairperson to ensure that the discussions are focused, to ensure that the discussions are being kept on course. But also, it is the duty or the function of the chairperson to control overexcited members. Some members are just too overexcited. And because they are too overexcited, they might disturb the meeting. They will end up confusing the meeting. So it is very important for the chairperson to make sure that they have control over those members who are overexcited. But also another role of the chairperson is electing contributions from each member, ensuring that each member is participating, at least pointing out others, giving them an opportunity to give out their views, to give out their contribution. Because sometimes you are in a meeting, you might find that maybe it's just two or three people who are so vocal and who are always talking. There are other members who are not contributing. So it is the responsibility, it is the duty and the function of the chairperson to ensure that all the members are participating. All the members are making significant contributions to the meeting. No one should be left behind. Creating even a good atmosphere within the meeting room, it is also a role and a function of a chairperson. Make sure, making sure that there is a conducive environment 
to make sure that everyone feels free to participate in the meeting. So it is the responsibility of the chairperson to create that good, conducive environment for the meeting. And also, summarizing the discussions from time to time. At least coming back and summarizing, making sure that whatever uh, all the members are moving together in terms of what is agreed. Okay, we've talked about this, 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 and we've concluded it this way. Okay, we've talked about this and we've made this resolution. So you are making sure that you are taking the members on board. So it is very important for the chairperson to summarize the discussions from time to time. But also working to end the meeting on schedule. Earlier on, we talked about this is the responsibility of the chairperson to make sure that the meeting starts on the agreed time, on the scheduled time. It also applies to the ending of the meeting because other people there might also have other pro programs. And because of the fact that in the notice of the meeting, maybe it was indicated that this meeting will start from 14 hours to 16 hours. So people will plan that to say within 14 to 16 I'm attending the meeting. But after 16 hours, they might also even have other meetings or arrange other activities that they want to perform. So if the meeting is not ending as, as, as scheduled, you might end up inconveniencing the other members that also do have other programs that they want to perform after that particular meeting. So it is very important to ensure that the chairperson makes sure that the meeting ends on schedule. And also at the end of the day, the, meeting has, the, the chairperson has the responsibility of thanking all the members for their input, for their coming, for their participation. At least you appreciate the efforts and the, the energies that have been put in by the members. So as you can see, when you look at the chairperson of a meeting, you can see that he's a very key person. He's a very important person for a successful meeting of a company. Because the roles of the chairperson are starting well before the meeting starts. Arranging the agenda, sending the no preparing the notice, sending the notice, looking at the venue, looking at the time, and looking at all those issues. And then after that, the role also goes further, even to the, f the time when the meeting is being conducted. Ensuring that the meeting now is being conducted in a proper way. And also making sure that the meeting ends in a proper way. So the chairperson is a very, very important person when you talk about a meeting. So as we talked about earlier on, it is very important for people to be saved with a notice of a meeting. Mostly when you are talking about a general meeting, it is very important that a notice of the general meeting is sent to all the concerned members so that everyone knows about the meeting. So if a general, meet, if a general meeting is called, a notice of some specific period is required. And according to the company laws, according to the bylaws, or according to the articles of incorporation, there will be a specification to say if we are to have a general meeting, the notice of the general meeting may be need to be provided 21 days before the meeting. Or the notice of the general meeting need to be provided so many days before the meeting. And that needs to be followed. Because if you provide the notice of the meeting, which is not in line with the stipulated number of days, that means that meeting can easily be invalidated. That meeting can, will end up being taken as a not a valid meeting. That meeting can be challenged. The resolutions of that meeting can be challenged because they will say, no, this meeting was done illegally. It was not done according to our terms and conditions, according to our constitution, according to our articles of incorporation. So it is very important to ensure that notices of meetings are sent within the specified required period. And the notice must be provided to every shareholder and it should contain the information that is there. So it is the responsibility of the chairperson with the support of the secretary to make sure that each and every shareholder has received a notice of the meeting. So the notice of the meeting should have date, time, 
and location of the meeting. That needs to be included. When is the meeting going to take place? At what time is the meeting going to take place? And where is the meeting going to take place? But also the type of meeting. Is it a general meeting? Is it an extraordinary general meeting? Is it any other meeting? So that needs to be very clear. And also even the nature of the meeting. That also needs to be well clarified. There should also be a statement declaring that every shareholder has the right to appoint a proxy. You need to indicate. Because maybe other shareholders are not available during that time. You need to indicate that if you are not available, you can, you can select or you can send a proxy to represent you in the meeting. And also it should include date the notice is issued and name of the person calling for that meeting. All this information needs to be included in the notice of a general meeting. Date, time and location of the meeting, type of meeting, nature of the meeting, statement declaring that every member has the right to appoint a proxy, date the notice is issued, and also name of the person calling for the meeting. So when we are talking about meetings, you remember we talked here about you need to indicate the type and nature of the meeting. That is here. We are talking about type and nature of the meeting. So, when you talk about meeting, there are basically two types of general meeting. So, you need to indicate what type of a general meeting is it. Is it an annual general meeting or it is an extraordinary general meeting? So, these are the two general meetings that... Um, uh, can happen. Annual general meeting and extraordinary general meeting. So, what is a general meeting? When we talk about in the context of a limited company, what do we mean when we talk about a general meeting? What is a general meeting in the context of a limited company? So, any formal meeting of a limited company, of a limited company's shareholders is called a general meeting. So, if you have a limited company, and you have a meeting of all the shareholders of that limited company, that one is called a general meeting. And the conduct of this meeting is governed by the Companies Act. So how the meetings are done is governed by the Companies Act. I think in Zambia we have the Companies Act of um, 2017. So that provides, uh, should be 2017 or 2018, that provides the specification in terms of uh, how that meeting should be conducted. The conduct of those meetings is well articulated and well guided through that program, through the Companies Act. So the Companies Act will provide that. So yes, in Zambia we are talking about the Companies Act of 2017, as I earlier said. So the Companies Act of 2017 will provide guidance in terms of how the meetings are supposed to be conducted, how any shareholders' meetings are supposed to be done. And general meetings are usually called by directors to allow shareholders to discuss the following types of matters. So we want to look at what are some of the types of matters that are discussed during general meetings. Matters discussed during the general meetings include the appointment and removal of a director or directors. So no, one person cannot just come in and appoint or remove a director. That is supposed to be done through a general meeting. So during the general meeting, the general meeting can appoint director or directors. During the general meeting, they can also remove a director, basing on valid reasons. But also the general meet, during the general meeting, they can change the director's power. So what power do the directors have? So the powers that the directors do have are confined to them through the general meeting. So the general meeting also do have the powers to change the powers of the directors. The general meeting has also, uh, can also be involved in altering the shareholders' agreement. So the shareholders' agreement can only be altered or can only be changed 
through a general meeting. You can also discuss about altering of companies' financial issues. So, alterations to find companies' financial issues are matters that need to be discussed at a general meeting. Even if you want to change the name of the company, changing the name of the company can also be discussed at a general meeting. Because by the end of the day, now you need all the members who are present to, provide, to approve that change. Because if it's not passed through the general meeting, then you cannot change. Changing even the structure of the company, changing the organogram of the company, that can also be discussed at a general meeting. But also altering the objectives of the business. You are trying to change the focus area, the objectives of the business. That can also be discussed at a general meeting. Issuing of more company shares. That can also be discussed at a general meeting. Even approving share transfers. That can be done, uh, discussed at the general meeting. Or creating new share classes. That can also be discussed. Even when you talk, you, you want to dissolve a company, those decisions need to be discussed at the general meeting. And also it can, during the general meeting, you can deal with legal claims and proceeding. So as you can see, the general meeting is an important meeting because looking at what we have in this, the first slide and the next slide, you are talking about big, big issues that are so key to the management of a company. These are discussed at a general meeting. That's why I said a general meeting is an important meeting. Even that's why earlier on we looked at the fact of the notice to say the notice and even the agenda of the meeting need to be circulated well in advance so that people do have enough time to prepare for this meeting. Because you cannot just come in a meeting without notice and say we want to change director's powers. You change from where to, to what? You want to appoint or remove a director, basing on what? So people need to have enough time to at least prepare for the meeting because this is an important meeting. This is a meeting that is handling important issues that relates to the management of the company. So in, in these companies, we also have a board, a board of directors. So. The board of directors, once they have been instituted, they are supposed to have a board meeting. So we want to look at the first board meeting of directors. After just being appointed, instituted, then they need to have a board meeting. So the purpose of this meeting is to provide an opportunity for directors to discuss the formalities of the new business. Because this is the first meeting. This is the first board meeting. So. During this time, they can consult the articles of association. They can determine the rights, duties, and responsibility of each director. It's made clear during this meeting. You are the director. What are your rights? What are your duties? What are your ob um, obligations? Confirm the objectives, vision, and core values of the company. Allo uh, allotment of shares, issuing share certificates, and appointing a strong leader as the chairperson of the board. Because now these have just been elected. You have the board of directors. But within that, you need to appoint the chairperson of the board. So this is all, all these activities are done during the first board meeting. So apart from having the first board meeting, then regularly, as specified or as need arise, there is need for the company to be having board meetings. And when you talk about board meeting, we are talking about official meeting of a limited company's director. So the directors of a limited company will be meeting regularly, and these meetings are called board meetings. And these individuals, when we talk about the directors, they are appointed to manage a limited company on behalf of its shareholders. So you have guarantors or you have shareholders who are not actively now involved in the management of the, of the company. So they appoint the directors, the board of directors, to manage the company on behalf of the shareholders. So board meetings are held when directors need collectively make decisions 
or they can present proposals, discuss various issues that affect the company. If they want to review the financial position of the business, they can do that at the board meeting. They want to discuss what are, uh, what strategies should they use in terms of business and all that. They also discuss during the board meetings. So, in terms of a company, there will be a number of meetings that can take place. You can talk about meetings of the shareholders, whereby the shareholders can meet. You can talk about general meetings, whereby um, you have like the general meetings, say general open meeting. You can have class meetings. You can have meeting of the directors, but also you can have meeting of the creditors. So these are the various meetings that takes place. So as you can see in that chart, when you talk about meetings, you have three major categories of meetings. You have meetings of shareholders, you have meetings of directors, and you have meetings of creditors. So these are the three major meetings, major categories of meetings that can take place. Meeting of shareholders, meeting of directors, and meeting of creditors. Now, under the meeting of shareholders, you have two specific meetings. You have the general meeting, and also you have class meetings. And under the general meeting, you can have statutory meetings, you can have the annual general meeting, you can also have the extraordinary general meeting. So that's on the shareholders' side. General meetings, class meetings. Under general meetings, statutory meetings, annual general meeting, extraordinary general meeting. When you talk about the directors, you have board meetings and committee meetings. Because within the board, you also have smaller, smaller committees. You have a legal committee, you have a financial com finance committee, maybe you can have an operation committee, and all the other committees, smaller, smaller committees that are there within that board. So you have the directors meeting, board, of, board meetings for the directors, but also committee meetings. And then, under the creditors, you can have meeting of debenture holders, but also meeting of creditors and contributors at the time of liquidation of the company. So these are the major meetings that take place in a limited company. Shareholders meetings, directors meetings, creditors meetings, and then we have these other meetings that comes below, below that. So, when we are talking about the meetings, now we want to go a bit deeper in terms of uh, going through the various meetings that are supposed to take place. For example, we have what we call a statutory meeting. So, every public company limited by shares and every company limited by guarantee and having a share capital shall within a period of not less than one month, no more than six months from the date on which the company is entitled to commence business, hold a general meeting. So these are statutory meetings. These are meetings that are there by law. That's what we are talking about. I think in another slide we already talked about statutory meetings somewhere, somewhere. So these are meetings that are there by law here. We have the statutory meeting here. So this is according to the law. The law clearly specifies to say within such type of a period, Within such time, a period of not less than one month, no more than six months, from the date of which the company is entitled to commence business, they must hold a general meeting of the members of the company. So this is legal. This is according to the, to the act. So this is, that, this is why this meeting is referred to as a statutory meeting. You also have annual general meetings. So every company must in each year hold in addition to any other meeting a general meeting as its annual general meeting and must specify the meeting as such in the notices calling it. So each and every company need to have a general meeting. So you need to have at least annual general meeting each and every year. And apart from that, one other key issue that we talked about when you are talking about a company is the issue of shares. So what are shares? So share means share in the share capital of a company. So the capital of a company is divided into certain indivisible units of fixed amount. 
And this indivisible unit of fixed amount is what is called as shares. And people can buy shares within the company. So that's what shares are. And when we talk about debentures, we are saying it includes debenture stock, bonds, or any other instruments of a company evidencing a debt, whether constituting a charge on the asset of the company or not. And you remember when we were talking about the meetings, we also talked, I think, about the meetings of debenture holders. So this is also another meeting that is supposed to be undertaken within a company. And we've been talking about directors, meeting of directors, director, director, and all that. So what do we mean when we are talking about a director in the company's context? So the person, one who takes active interest in the well-being of a company, and one of the members of the board of directors is called as a director of the company. And the director is a person from a board of directors who leads or supervises the functioning of the company. So the director is, is, is elected or is, uh, comes from the board of the directors and is the one who leads and supervises the functioning of the company. And when you look at the Companies Act of 2017, the Companies Act generally uh, defines uh, in terms of how a director is appointed to the board. So a person who is appointed or elected member of the board of directors of a company and has the responsibility of determining and implementing policies along others in the board. So when you talk about a director in a company, the roles of the director and all that is clearly outlined in the Companies Act of 2017. So companies need to follow that. When you talk about issues of powers of directors, appointment of directors, and all that that goes through it should be in line with what is there in the, uh, as in line with the Companies Act. So, now we want to look at appointment of directors. So, you can either, it can be done either through first directors of the company, or appointment by the company, or appointment by the director, whereby you have additional directors and all that. Also, the appointment can be done by third parties. Appointment can be done by also proportional representation. But also appointment can be done from a central government. In, let's say, an example whereby it's a company whereby the government has 50 or more percent of the shares. So in that situation whereby the government has more control, uh, 51 percent of the shares or of the capital of that company, the company can, the government can be able to appoint directors. And we also need to differentiate when we are talking about directors and managing directors. So when you look at the word directors, directors are a bit passive. But when you talk about a managing director, these are more active. And the managing director is the most senior role in any company. This is the highest position in any other company. And it has the ultimate responsibility for the company's performance. The managing director will report to the chairman and shareholders who are leading a board of directors. So you have a board of directors. But on top of that, you have a managing director who leads that board of directors and is the one with the ultimate responsibility for the company's performance. If the company is not performing well, then it's the managing director who will be answerable to the board of directors, to the chairman, and to the other shareholders. So, how do you appoint directors or managing directors? So, as we already said, a board of directors, in some cases it's referred to as BOD, is a group of individuals that are elected as or elected to act as a representative of the stockholders to establish a corporate management related policy and make decisions on behalf of the company or on the major issues. So, what is happening is that the stockholders, the shareholders, will end up appointing directors. And it is these directors who will be responsible for the uh, management of the company. 
And according to the Companies Act, there are provisions on how directors can be appointed. So any person who is appointed by the members of a company to direct and administer the business of the company shall be deemed to be a director of the company whether or not he is called a director. So whether the position, because in some companies you have different titles and all that, but whether in that company they are called directors or not, but if that person is appointed by the members of the company to direct and administer the business of a company, that person will be deemed as a director. That's according to the Companies Act. And in this act, when we talk about the context of the director, it's about reference to the director, it's the reference to the directors acting collectively. Because you have a number of directors. And where a decision of the directors is required for them so to act, the decision shall be made by a resolution of the directors. So when you need a resolution that it should be made by all the directors, all of them should make the, direct, the resolution. And a requirement that a document be signed by the director shall be read as a requirement that a majority of the directors sign that document. So you are looking at any resolution that is passed. It needs to be signed by the majority of the directors. If a resolution is passed but is not signed by the majority of the directors, then that resolution will not be taken as a valid resolution. So all these, you can find it in the Companies Act, in terms of appointment of the directors. The number of directors of a company shall be the number of first directors named in the application for incorporation. So when you are filling the certificate, the forms for incorporation, you indicate the number of the, and the details of the directors. And the person named in the application for incorporation, the first director of the company, shall on the incorporation of the company be deemed to have been appointed as such with a term of office that ends at the first annual general meeting. That's so clear, so straightforward. So all this that we are reading now is more about what is in the Companies Act in terms of the appointment of directors. A person shall not be appointed as or as or continue to hold office as a director of a company if the person is a border corporate or an infant. You cannot have an infant, an infant, or any other person under the legal uh, disability, or any person prohibited or disqualified from doing so by an order, by a court order, but also any undischarged bankrupt. If someone has been declared bankrupt and has not been cleared of that, then that person cannot be appointed as a director. And even directors can be disqualified. So a director of a company shall cease to hold office as such if one is a judge bankrupt. That's what we are talking about last time. That you cannot appoint someone who is bankrupt to be a director. So if you are a director, but in the process you've been declared bankrupt, then you, you cease to be a director. Or is removed by order of a court from the office of trust on account of misconduct. If the court uh, found you uh, with a charge or guilt of a misconduct, then you can be removed by a court order. Raised now, in the Act, it also provides specification in terms of residence of directors and managing directors. So more than half of the directors of the company, the managing director of the company has a managing director or at least one executive director of the company has to be resident in Zambia. So you need to make sure that more than half of the directors of the company, if the company is registered under the Companies Act of Zambia, has to be resident in Zambia. The managing director has to be resident in Zambia. Even one executive director has to be resident in Zambia. This is according to the Companies Act. Now, what about vacation? How can one vacate the position of a director? So we want to look at the vacation of the position of a director. So a director may resign from his office by notice in writing to the company. 
So they need to give a notice in writing to the company if they want to vacate from their office. They are free. They can resign from that. In addition to other circumstances specified in the Act, a direct, an office of a director shall become vacant if the director is absent from meetings of the director held during a period of six months without the consent of the other director. Six months not attending meetings, then that one ceases to be a director. Holds an office of profit under the same company. That will also make that person to cease as a director. Or is directly or indirectly interested in any contract or proposed contract within that company and has failed to declare his interest. That can also lead to the vacation of the office of a director. And in terms of removal of a director, a company may by ordinary resolution at a general meeting of the company remove the office or, or any of the directors subject to their rights to claim damages from the company if removed in breach of contract. So a company at a general meeting can be able to remove the directors. And the Act also provides provisions in terms of appointment of managing directors. So the directors may from to time to time appoint one or more of their number to the office of managing director for such period as on such terms as they think fit and subject to the terms of the agreement. And may also do, they also do have the power to revoke such type of appointment. Then the managing director shall not, while holding the office, be subject to retirement by rotation or be taken to account in determining the rotation. So just still talking about the appointment. And also even the powers of the director are also included in the Act. So this slide just continues to talk about what are the powers of the director. The directors may exercise the powers of the company to borrow money, to charge, to charge any property or business of the company or any, or any, or any its uncalled capital and to issue debentures or to give any other security for a debt, liability, obligation of the company and all that. So the powers of the director are also covered in the Act. So all these slides are talking about the powers of the directors which you can be able to go through. And also the Act also provides do have provisions in terms of the limits of the directors. So what limitations do the directors and the managing director have? So the directors of a company shall not, without the approval, in accordance with this section of an ordinary resolution of the company, sell, lease, or otherwise dispose the whole or substantially the whole of the undertaking or assets of the company. They cannot do that. They cannot issue any new or uninsured shares in the company. They cannot create or grant any rights of options or entitlements to the holders. So these are just of the limits. So apart from the powers that they have, they should or the, the Act also provides in terms of what are the limits and also some of the interests in terms of the directors. It also provides clarification in terms of the remuneration of the um, directors. What remuneration should be given to the directors? So all these, I think you can be able to go through. It's also about uh, available in the Act. It is also important to look at issues how the, in the company you can make sure that uh, there is prevention of operation and mismanagement. So you are looking at issues of how do companies run, who run the companies, is it the majority shareholders or directors running them, how, are, how majority oppresses the minority, you need to look at issues. So these are some of the issues that also need to be looked into. So the operation of um, small or minority shareholders takes place by majority shareholders. In various companies, you have shareholders that have large shares in the company, majority shareholders and minority shareholders. So most of the time, you end up having a situation whereby the minority shareholders are oppressed by the majority shareholders. So the law, however, has not defined what is oppression, but certain prominent case laws 
has defined what operation is all about. So it can be operation in terms of interest, it can be operation in terms of certain individuals working together to push their own agenda and all that. So it is very important also to prevent operation in a company. So I think these are some of the slides that we can talk through in terms of how we can um, uh, prevent uh, operation, but also if, in terms of preventing management. So it means mismanagement of resources by the following means. So in some companies, they can deliberately be absence of basic records, drawing considerable expenses for personal purposes, not feeding, filing documents with the registrar of companies according to the Act, and where the managing director of the company continued in office after their terms of office. That's an aspect that is related to mismanagement, misuse of company resources, sale of assets at a very low price, maybe because the one that wants to buy is someone that is related to you and making secret profits. So these are part of mismanagement. So I think because of uh, time, we are almost reaching to the end. I think you can also look at auditors. When you talk about a company, it is important to have auditors to audit that company. And when you talk about an auditor, we are saying is a professional who is qualified to conduct an audit of a company. So when we talk about auditing, auditing, uh, an auditor has several duties. Examination, checking of books, documentation, who in cooperation, but also conventionality. So these are some of the duties and also the responsibilities of the auditor. But also they have rights and powers, like right of access to book of accounts. An auditor has rights to all the books of accounts, right to obtain information and explanation, right to receive notices, right to visit branches, right to collect any wrong statements, right to sign the audit report, right to being identified, and also right to receive uh, remuneration. So these are some of the rights of auditors. And this unit ends up with winding of companies, how you can wind up your company. This is also covered as in the Act. So this marks the end of Unit 2. So at least we've completed Unit 1, we've completed Unit 2. So thanks so much. Uh, this is where we are starting.
Good afternoon students. Today we are going to discuss about aggregate planning, factors affecting aggregate planning, importance of aggregate planning, aggregate planning strategies, master scheduling, functions of master production schedule, types of planning in production, inventory control systems, and inventory costs and inventory strategies, plant location, factors affecting plant location decisions and material requirement planning. So first one is aggregate planning. So what is aggregate planning? An aggregate planning is a marketing activity that is used for production which gives an advanced plan for the production department which means the aggregate plan concerns give the plans to, to the production department before of 3 to 18 months and it concerns with what quantity of materials and when to produce the same materials that is this is the plan that gives to the production department so that the organization to plan for the operations that is aggregate planning an organization can finalize its business plans on the recommendation of demand forecasts once business plans are ready an organization can do backward working from the final sales unit to raw materials required. Thus, annual and quarterly plans are broken down into labor, raw material, working capital, etc. The requirements over a medium range period 6 months to 18 months. This process of working out production requirements for a medium range is called aggregate planning. Factors affecting aggregate planning. Aggregate planning is an operational activity that critical to the organization as it looks to balance long term strategic planning with short term production success. Following factors are critical before an aggregate planning process can actually start. A complete information is required about available production facility and raw materials. So for making the aggregate plan it requires the complete information about the production facility and raw materials for the particular product. What are the production facilities are available? What methodologies? What are the type of machines and equipments they are using in the production department? And how they are getting the raw materials? The stockage of raw materials. So the full and complete information is required for making the aggregate plan. A solid demand forecast covering the medium range period. We have already seen that period for the aggregate planning is 
six to eighteen months, and and they can plan from three to eighteen months also. Financial planning surrounding the production cost, which includes raw material, labor, inventory planning, etc. The the aggregate planning it plans with the raw material and labor. So considering the labor is also a factor in aggregate planning. Organization policy around labor management, quality management, etc. Importance of aggregate planning. Aggregate planning plays an important part in achieving long-term objectives of the organization. Aggregate planning helps in achieving financial goals by reducing overall variable cost and improving the bottom line. So, the long term plan ensues to reduce the variable cost or the manufacturing cost in the production so that it can, give, it can easily reach the financial goals. So, the aggregate, aggregate planning is used to reduce the cost. Maximum utilization of the available production facility and the important factor is to utilize the maximum availability available production facility for aggregate planning, which means the aggregate planning uses the production facility at its highest maximum possible and it provides customer delight by matching demand and reducing wait time for customers. Reduce investment in inventory stocking and aggregate planning ensures the lower stocking in inventories and matching the demand at the time. It is able to meet scheduling goals thereby creating a happy and satisfied workforce. So these long term plan or uh, the aggregate planning is satisfied the customers and organization by achieved the scheduling goals. Aggregate planning strategies. There are three types of aggregate planning strategies available for organization to choose from and they are as follows. The strategies are level strategy, chase strategy, hybrid strategy. Level strategy is nothing but to plan for stocking the proper inventories and meeting the demand which, may, which means it gives the maximization to the production. So, the production will be higher in this strategy. As the name suggests, level strategy works to maintain a steady production rate and workforce level. So, in this strategy, the organization requires a robust focus demand as to increase or decrease production in anticipation of lower or higher customer demand. For fulfilling the higher customer demand, it needs to produce the higher production of the products. Advantages of level strategy is steady workforce. It pushes and it motivates the steady production and it wants to utilize the all resources of the production facilities and maximize the production and the disadvantages of level strategy is high inventory and increased backlogs. So the level strategy needs high inventory so it needs to stock the higher amount of raw materials so that the organization's capital is brought in the form of inventory. This is the main 
disadvantages of level strategy and chase strategy so chase strategy means when to make or to produce the products when meeting the demand as the name suggests chase strategy looks to dynamically match demand with production advantage of chase strategy is lower inventory levels and backlog this advantage is lower productivity quality and depressed workforce hybrid strategy hybrid strategy is nothing but to balance between level strategy and chase strategy so which means to maintain the normal inventories so that it can balance between level strategy and chase strategy master scheduling so the master scheduling is nothing but it is the detailed planning process that tracks the manufacturing output and matches the customer orders that have been placed so with master plan master scheduling is the planned process which follows and tracks the manufacturing outputs and also to deliver to the customers as per the received orders a master production schedule is a schedule of the completions of the end items and these completions are very much planned in nature master production schedule acts as a very distinct and important linkage between the planning processes with the help of this schedule one can know the requirements for the individual end items by date and quantity in companies master production schedule are generally produced in order to know the number of each product that is to be made over some planning horizon this schedule forms a very unique part of the company's sales program which deals with the planned response to the demands of the market a master production schedule is also in management language referred to as the master of the schedules as the schedule provides the production planning purchasing and top management the most needed information required for planning and control of the whole manufacturing process or the operation a master production schedule is a plan for individual commodities to be produced in each time period such as production staffing inventory etc it is usually linked to manufacturing where the plan indicates when and how much of each product will be demanded so he a master production schedule is lead in the manufacturing department and it informs the manufacturing unit to produce the product and the quantity it gives the manufacturing unit that how much of the quantity of product to be produced and in which plan to produce in the manufacturing unit functions of master production schedule translating plans this portion of the software determines the level of operations that balance market demand with material labor and equipment capabilities this is because the master schedule translates the plan into a specific number of items that are needed to be produced within a given time so when 
there is a demand for the products master production can be scheduled as based on the material availability the labors they are having and as per the equipment capabilities so that they can plan and sometimes they also translate those plans as per the market trends evaluating alternative schedules the master schedule producers trial and error schedules that give production alternate routes to follow this accounts for any unexpected mishaps within production to be taken care of immediately so when the unexpected problem happens the master production will be take care of immediately it gives the immediate process for the unexpected problem it gives the solution and produce capacity requirements this software aid capacity planning through establishing capacity requirements capacity requirements are directly received through master production scheduling and therefore correlates with capacity planning so the master production schedule will give the capacities to produce so that the production will be produced there as per the planning that given by master production schedule facilitating information processing the master schedule determines whenever the deliveries are needed to be made this coordinates with various management information systems such as marketing finance and others so the master production schedule coordinates with marketing and finance department for delivery for the quicker deliveries utilization of capacity master production scheduling software establishes load and utilization requirements for machines and equipment this allows for the absolute best capacity utilization and a much more efficient flow of production the five types of planning in production the five types of production planning include the following job method so what is job method in the job method the jobs will be performed by a single person or a team so in the and in this job method they can start the production once the orders are received this method includes the task of manufacturing a product that is handled either by a single worker or by a group so this single worker or this group is performed the full operations which means the product will be will be completed by this group or the single person the type of jobs that may utilize this method may be either small scale or complex this method is usually incorporated when customer specifications are essential in the production small scale jobs are those for which production is considered easy as the worker has the required skill set for the job so the job method of the production type is considering with the simplest method of production and using the skillful labor for the particular job it is also important to note that very little specialized equipment is needed in these task or jobs considering these components the customer specifications and requirements can be included at any time during progression of the job without altering the process
So the job method using the perfect components are which perfect method is choose for the particular job or the product. Flow method very similar to the batch method which is also included in this block. The aim is to improve material and workflow, reduce labor cost and ultimately complete the work much quicker. So the job is performed in the flow method is complete quicker so that it reduces the labor cost. Differing from the batch method, work progresses as a flow, hence the name the flow method. Assembly lines that make televisions tend to utilize this method. The product is manufactured by a number of collective operations in which materials move from multiple stages without time lags and interruptions. So, once the operation is completed, there is no time gap for other operation. It moves quickly. Mass production method. Within this method, the goods are usually produced utilizing standard techniques such as balanced production and product wise layout. Batch method. So, the batch method of production is nothing but the number of teams used for the number of operations. Here, the product has number of operations. So, this number of operations performed by or operated by number of teams. So, one operation is finished, then it passed to the other operation. And after that operation finished, it passed to the next operation. So, this process will be continuous until the product has finished or changed as a finished product. As mentioned before, this is similar to be the flow method. This method usually falls under businesses that are growing that also have growing production volumes as well. It requires a division of work into parts. For a part of work to process, it is essential that the previous parts get completed. An example of a business that uses this would be electronic parts manufacturing because it requires specialization of labor for each division. Process method. This method includes the product being produced utilizing a uniform and standardized sequence. Very specific and sophisticated machinery is utilized here and production is continuous. Inventory control systems. Supply chain management plays a pivotal role in ensuring the goods and services are delivered on time to customers. So supply chain management is nothing but to deliver the goods or products at the correct time in correct place. Within supply chain management, the inventory management plays a central role. Inventory involves various tasks, investment, space management, etc. Also, there are chances that store inventory may get damaged or get stolen adding to extra cost to the company. Therefore, it is important to have a robust inventory management for an organization. Inventory holding. For an organization, it becomes important to hold inventory for the following reason. Inventory holding ensures 
that operation delay do not impact delivery to customers every firm must hold the adequate in inventory for their operations and productions and for the effective productivity of an organization and inventory is the stock that the organization maintains to meet its future requirements for production and selling it also ensures that company can meet spikes or fluctuations in product demand so when there is a demand for the particular raw material then the inventory helps to the organization in productivity so there is no any fluctuation in the productivity it ensures that there is flexibility in production it ensures that any delay by suppliers do not affect working of the company sometimes there is a problem that suppliers delay by supplying the raw materials but when it is holding the required quantity of raw materials then there is no problem in productivity so it ensures that any delay by suppliers that won't affect the working of the company and the productivity of the company considering the above inventory holding objectives next step for the company is to make inventory related decision inventory decision involves two major considerations first is the order quantity of the raw material and second is timing for placing those orders inventory models inventory management is based upon two basic models example in independent demand inventory model and dependent demand inventory model so independent demand inventory model is nothing but to producing the products without demand so the the manufacturing unit is producing the product without the demand for the product so the products are producing for stockage and sales that is independent demand inventory model it talks about raw material demand which is dependent upon prevailing market conditions and is not correlated to any raw material currently used by the organization finished goods is an appropriate example for independent demand inventory model and dependent demand inventory model so when there's a demand for the product then the production is high in organization so as per the demand the organization is producing higher the products that is dependent demand inventory model and it talks about raw material demand which are integral parts of production and form important part of material resource planning for example demand for raw material can be established as the basis of demand of finished products inventory costs there are three broad categories of cost that associated with inventory holding cost ordering cost and setup cost so the holding cost is nothing but the total cost of the sum of inventory so the total cost it spent for inventory is called holding cost and it is carrying the cost that associated with inventory over a period of time they include insurance warehousing interest extra headcount extra ordering cost of the ordering cost is nothing but the purchased and the receiving 
materials cost is ordering cost and it is associated with purchasing of raw material and receiving raw materials they include forms order processing office maintenance supplies and staff associated with ordering setup cost so the setup cost is nothing but the cost bill spent for the installing or setting the machines that is setup cost it is associated with installation of machine for production they include clean up cost retooling cost and adjustment cost so it is not included only the new machines that is installed the cleaning up and when the machine is repaired sometimes we change the tools or the parts so these repairing cost also included and comes under setup cost perpetual inventory system so what is perpetual inventory system perpetual inventory system is the is the application that used to do manage a correct inventory which means it have it gives the clear record of what is sold and what is received at the correct time and it changes the record in the inventory at the transaction which means when the stock is sold or received so up to date it has it has the up to date record and gives the correct stock in the inventory system so when you use a perpetual inventory system it continually updates inventory records and accounts for additions and subtractions when inventory items are received sold from stock moved from one location to another and picked from inventory and scrap so when any of these happens this system is used to add up or subtract the particular system that taken or received some organizations prefer perpetual inventory systems because they deliver up to date inventory information and better handle minimal physical inventory counts perpetual inventory systems also are preferred for tracking inventory because they deliver accurate results on a continual basis when managed properly this type of inventory control system works best when used in conjunction with a database of inventory qualities and bin locations updated in real time by warehouse workers using barcode scanners periodic inventory system so the periodic inventory system is giving the record of the inventory at the periodic of time it it doesn't have the up to date record it only gives at the time at the time of inventory periodic inventory system do not track inventory on a daily basis so it it doesn't record as the daily basis rather they allow organizations to know the beginning and the ending inventory levels during a certain period of time so a certain period of time we can know the levels of inventory by using periodic inventory system these types of inventory control systems track inventory using physical inventory counts when physical inventory is complete the balance in the purchases account shifts into the inventory account and is adjusted to match the cost of the ending inventory organizations may choose whether to calculate the cost of ending inventory using some inventory account 
accounting methods or another method. So keep in mind that beginning inventory is the previous periods ending inventory. Barcode inventory systems. Barcode inventory system is nothing but to know the inventory level by barcode scanners and barcode technology that runs on computer. So it's a software that used by barcode technology. Nowadays so many organizations that used barcode inventory systems. Inventory management systems using barcode technology are more accurate and efficient than those using manual processes. When used as part of an overall inventory control system, barcode systems update inventory levels automatically when workers scan them with a barcode scanner or mobile device. The benefits of using barcoding in your inventory management processes are numerous and include accurate records of all inventory transactions, eliminating time consuming data errors that occur frequently with manual or paper systems, eliminating manual data entry mistakes, ease and speed of scanning, updates on hand inventory automatically, record transaction histories and easily determine minimum levels and record quantities, streamline documentation and reporting, rapid return on investment, facilitate the movement of inventory within warehouses and between multiple locations and from receiving to picking, packing and shipping. Radio frequency identification inventory system. So the radio frequency identification inventory systems use active and passive technology to manage inventory movements. Active radio frequency identification technology uses fixed tag readers throughout the barrows and it tags past the reader and the movement is recorded in the inventory management software. For this reason, active systems work best for organizations that require real-time inventory tracking or where inventory security has been an issue. So the passive frequent radio frequency identification technology on the other hand requires the use of handheld readers to monitor inventory movement. When a tag is read, the data is recorded by the inventory management software and this technology has a reading range of approximately 40 feet with passive technology and 300 feet with active technology. Plan location decisions. So there are there are so many decisions involved in locating a plant. The selected location should have the proper facilities for locating the plant and the availability of raw materials and to reduce the transportation are the important factors for locating the plant and the availability of water, power also the important factor for locating the plant. So before locating a plant, the management of an organization analyzed all the criteria and selected and evaluated the best one for locating the plant. Plant location refers to the choice of the region where 
men, materials, money, machinery and equipment are brought together for setting up a business or factory. A plant is a place where the cost of the product is kept to low in order to maximize gains. And what is plant? It is transmitting the raw materials into finished product. So where the product is producing is called plant. And identifying an ideal location is very crucial. It should always maximize the net advantage and must minimize the unit cost of production and distribution. Plant location decisions are very important because once the plant is located at a particular site, then the organization has to face the pros and cons of it. It's nothing but advantage and disadvantage of that initial decisions. So, to evaluate and analyze the location properly, here so much of care must be taken to select the location for the plant because to change the plant is not easy. There are so many capital and investment involved in to selecting the plant location. So once after creating all the resources in the plant, it is not easy to change the plant to remove all the resources and equipment and machines. So, the perfect analysis and survey is required for locating a plant. Factors affecting the plant location. Decisions regarding selecting a location need a balance of several factors. These are divided into primary factors and secondary factors. So, the primary factors are availability of raw materials, nearness to the market, availability of labor and transport facilities. And the secondary factors are nothing but based on their climatic conditions and availability of water and fuel. So, the primary factors. First one is availability of raw materials. The plant is located near to the availability of raw materials which is required for the product, the particular product the plant is going to produce. Availability of raw materials is the most important factor in the plant location decisions. Usually manufacturing units where there is the conversion of raw materials into finished goods is the main task then such organization should be located in a place where the raw material availability is maximum and cheap. And next factor is it should be located near to the market so that it can reduce the transport cost and it can render the quick services to the customers. Also, when you are locating near to the market, you can quickly know the market trends. If the plant is located far away from the market, then the chances of spoiling and breakage become high during transport. So if you located near to the market, the transport, the transport length is low, the distance of the transport is low. So there is a minimum chance of spoiling and breakage in the products. If the industry is nearer to the market, then it can grasp the market, market share by offering quick services. Availability of labor. Another most important factor which influences the plant location decisions is the availability of labor. The combination of the adequate number of labor with suitable skills and reasonable labor wages can highly benefit the firm. So it is important to consider 
the availability of labor in that selected area for the plant. However, labor intensive firms should select the plant location which is nearer to the source of manpower. Transport facilities. In order to bring the raw materials to the firm to carry in the finished goods to the market. Transport facilities are very important. Depending on the size of the finished goods or raw materials, a suitable transportation is necessary such as roads, water, rail and air. Here the transportation cost highly increase the cost of production. Such organization cannot complete with the rival firms. Here the point considered is tran transportation cost must be kept low because the cost for the production is also dependent on the transport cost. So to select the plant which is having a more, uh, more and more transport facilities. Availability of fuel and power. Unavailability of fuel and power is the major drawback in selecting a location for firms. Fuel and power are necessary for almost all the manufacturing units. So, locating the firms nearer to the coal beds and power industries can highly reduce the wastage of efforts, money and time due to the unavailability of the power and availability of water. Depending on the nature of the plant, firms should give the importance to the, to the locations where water is available. For example, Power plants where use water to produce power should be located near the water bodies. Secondary factors. <coughs> Secondary factors is concerned with suitability of climate, government policies, availability of finance and so on. So suitability of climate. In the firms, it has many resources also including machines and equipment. So some of the machines and equipments are should be keep in the particular temperature or particular climate. So to select the climate is also important factor for selecting the plant. Climate is really an influencing factor for industries such as agriculture, leather and textile etc. For such industries Extreme humid or dry conditions are not suitable for particular plant locations. Climate can affect the labor efficiency and productivity. Government policies. While selecting a location for the plant, it is very important to know the local existing government. Policies such as licensing policies and institutional finance government subsidies and government benefits that associated with establishing a unit in the urban areas or rural areas because the government policies is differ from rural and urban areas. Availability of finance. Finance is the most important factor for the smoother functioning of business. It should not be far away from the plant location. However, in case of decisions regarding plant location, it is the secondary important factor because financial needs can be fulfilled easily if the firm is running smoothly. Competition between states. In order to attract the investment at large scale industries, various states offer subsidies benefits and sales tax exemptions to the new units. However, the incentives may not be big but it can help the firms during its startup stages. Availability of facilities. Availability of basic facilities such as schools, hospitals, 
housing and recreation clubs etc it can motivate the workers to stick to the jobs on the other hand these facilities must be provided by the organization but here most of the employees give preference to work in the locations where all these facilities are available outside also so while selecting plant location organization must give the preference to the location where it is suitable for providing other facilities also disposal of waste disposal of waste is a major problem that particularly for industries such as chemical sugar and leather etc so that the selected plant location should have the provision for the disposal of waste and the selected location has the the proper facility for disposal the waste of wastage products materials requirement plan materials requirement planning is nothing but it is designed to improve the productivity for business and companies use material requirement planning systems to estimate the quantities of raw materials and schedule their deliveries so the material requirement planning is used to survey the raw materials and use the deliveries of the schedule success of an operation department of any organization is dependent upon an efficient production plan one of the key efficient essential of a production plan is material and manufacturing planning system material requirement planning plays a pivotal role in assembly line production material requirement planning is a system that based on material requirement planning is an information system for production planning based on inventory management so it gives the information to the production department based on the stockage levels the basic components of material planning are material planning provides information that all the required raw material and products are available for production and it ensures that inventory level are maintained at its minimum levels but also ensures that material and product are available when our production is scheduled so therefore it's helping in matching the demand and supply material planning provides information of production planning and scheduling but also provides information around dispatch and stocking objectives of material requirement planning material requirement planning is processed with production planning and inventory control system and its three objectives are as follows primary objective is to ensure that material and components are available for production and final products are ready for dispatch another primary objective is not only maintain minimum inventory but also it ensures the right quantity of material is available at the right time to produce the right quantity of final products so it is concerning not only to maintain the stock it's also consider how much quantity of material is required for producing the product and another primary objective is to ensure planning of all manufacturing processes this scheduling of different job works as to minimize or remove any kind of idle time for machine and workers 
advantages of material resource planning. It helps in maintain minimum inventory levels. So it helps to organization that not to invest invest so much capital in inventories. With minimum inventory levels, material planning also reduces the associated cost. So when you are having the stockage at the minimum, then you can spend only the minimum cost. Material tracking becomes easy and it ensures that economic order quantity is achieved for all lot orders. Material planning smoothens capacity utilization and allocates correct time to products as per demand forecast. This advantages of material resource planning. Material planning is highly dependent on inputs and it receives from other systems or department. If input information is not correct then output for material planning will also be incorrect. And material planning requires maintenance of robust database with all information pertaining inventory records, production schedule etc. Material planning system requires proper training for end users as to get maximum out of the system and this system requires substantial investment of time and capital. Implementation of material resource planning. The implementation and success of material resource planning dependent on following factors. Acceptability of by top management about advantages and benefits. So the top management to accept the benefits and give the approval for the implementation of material resource planning. Proper training and participation of all workers and personnel. So to give the proper tra training and ensures that all the workers have participated in the training and development program. Precision and accuracy of input data for accurate and reliable results. So to maintain the input data with accuracy is very important for implementing the material resource planning.